Thank you. May all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 People versus Letitia Stauk. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm glad everybody made it in in light of our uh, epic snowmageddon. Um, again, has anything occurred since we were last together that causes any of you to believe that you could not continue to serve as a fair and impartial juror in this case? If so, please raise your hand. No response. All right. Uh, with that, prosecution, call your next witness, please. Thanks, Sean. Good morning. Uh, we would call Dr. Jackie Brimmett. Snuck up on me. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you would wear, uh, raise your right hand. Do you swear for the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Yeah. Thanks, Judge. Good morning, Doctor. How are you? Good morning. Good. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name for the record? My name is Jackie Grimmett, G R I M M E T T. What do you do for a living? I'm a forensic psychologist. How long have you been a forensic psychologist? Like 10 years. Could you give the jury a little bit of your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in psychology and health master's degree in counseling and a doctoral degree in clinical psychology. And are you working currently? I am. Uh, what is your profession? I am in private practice as a forensic psychologist. And where do you practice? What states? Uh, I live in Hawaii. I practice full time in Colorado. And are you licensed to practice psychology in both those states? Yes. Uh, do you have to be licensed um, in the field of psychology to perform evaluations and do forensic evaluations? Yes. Could you give the jury uh, a little bit of your background with regards to professional memberships that you belong to? Um, I belong to the American Psychological Association, the Colorado Psychological Association, the Hawaii Psychological Association, and I'm a specialist in the American Board of Forensic Psychology. And are you a board certified forensic psychologist? Yes. What does that mean? Um, it means I've gone through a rigorous peer reviewed process um, involving a written exam, uh, submitting practice samples and submitting to a three-hour oral exam with a panel of experts um, who then attest to that I've reached a level of competence in the field of forensic psychology. It sounds like that's something more than just sending a check to someone and getting a certificate in the mail. It was a multiple-year process. And what percentage of forensic psychologists are board certified? Do you know? Um, I think that there's about 3% of psychologists in the country are board certified in forensic psychology, and that totals about 350 psychologists in total. And are you uh, in a position now where you approve others who may be seeking to be board certified? Yes, I serve on the exam faculty for the board. So I review practice samples and I conduct oral exams. And so you get to do what you had to they do did before. To me. You get to evaluate those people. Yes. How long have you been doing that? Uh, about a year and a half. The jury's heard a little bit about what a forensic um, psychological evaluation is. Uh, how many of those have you conducted in your career? Um, probably about 1,500. And 1,500, I, we're not going to get into those. <laughs> but have those been both for the court, the prosecution, and defense counsel? Uh, the majority of the work I do is court ordered. Um, I have done a few evaluations at the request of the prosecution. I have done a fair bit of private evaluation for the defense. Okay. Um, what about your um, past professional history? What kind of jobs have you held as a forensic psychologist or a psychologist? Um, my first job as a psychologist was as a forensic psychologist. I worked at the Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo as a forensic evaluator doing competency evaluations full time for about four and a half years before I left to pursue private practice. I imagine a lot of those 1500 evaluations came from that role. Uh, at, th at this point, about a third. <laughs> OK, what about after that? What'd you do? Um, I've been in private practice, mostly doing competency and, and sanity work. Um, I do some civil um, capacity evaluations, undue influence uh, regarding wills for the elderly. 
uh, some mitigation work for the defence. Um, I both do private practice second opinion competency evaluations and I'm also a contractor for the state. And in your career, have you both uh, performed, uh, I, uh, we'll rephrase that, but have you treated patients uh, for their psychological issues? Yes, prior to becoming a psychologist, I was a licensed professional counsellor for 10 years um, and I treated uh, people doing therapy weekly, mostly um, returning soldiers at Fort Carson from Afghanistan and Iraq. Post-traumatic stress symptoms? Yes. Um, is a forensic examination different from what would be called a clinical evaluation as a psychologist? Yes. Uh, what's the difference? Um, a clinical evaluation um, is typically requested by the person coming to seek treatment. Um, they've got symptoms and they're in some discomfort and you develop a therapeutic relationship with them, you're there to help them. In a forensic evaluation, the person being evaluated is never the person who actually requested the evaluation. It's typically an attorney or the court. Um, there is no therapeutic relationship there. You're not there to help them. You're there to help answer a legal question. So there's no treatment. Um, in a clinical evaluation, you take the patient at their word. What they tell you is their experience and that's what you treat. In a forensic evaluation, um, you consider what the person tells you, but you also look for collateral information to support that what they're telling you is genuine and there's records to document that what they're claiming to be experiencing is genuine. Have you been qualified as an expert in the field of forensic psychology in the past? Yes. Approximately how many times? About 80. 80? Yes. Uh, and have those all been in Colorado or other states? Colorado. You know, at this time, we would uh, ask that the court allow Dr. Grimmett to be qualified as an expert in the field of forensic psychology and render opinions um, in that field. Yes. No objection. The witness will be so qualified. Go ahead. Dr. Grimmett, could you explain to the jury how you became involved in this case? Excuse me. Yeah, I was approached by the defense to complete a court-ordered second opinion evaluation of competency to proceed. And uh, when you say court-ordered evaluation, what does that mean? Um, well, when somebody raises the issue of competency, um, the process is the court is, issues an order and the state has to conduct an initial evaluation. Um, either attorney can request a second opinion at that point and um, the judge then issues an order for a second opinion to take place. And, and really what I wanted to get to is, uh, were you aware that there'd already been a competency evaluation done in this case when you got this order to do the second evaluation? Yes. Uh, and is that common practice based on your experience? Um, I'm always aware there's been a previous evaluation. The fact that the defense requested you, how does that impact your evaluation in this case? Um, I try to take an impartial stance in every case. Um, my job is to help give the court information that they can use to come to an ultimate opinion on competency. Um, in pursuit of that, I contact the defense counsel and the prosecution to get their input. And um, I'm always considering if, if the other person, if the other side had asked me to do the evaluation, why would my opinion be the same? And I try to check any non-impartiality I might be experiencing. Okay. Uh, could you give, I'm, well, let me ask you, ha have you done insanity evaluations in your career as well? Yes. Could you let the jury know what the difference between a competency evaluation is and an insanity evaluation in a forensic setting? Sure. Um, succinctly, a competency evaluation is an evaluation of someone's present state. So the day I meet with them, how are they doing? Are there any impediments to them being able to proceed with their case? Uh, an insanity evaluation is a retrospective evaluation. So you're, you're assessing how they were doing at the time of the offense, not how they're doing now. And so with regards to this case, uh, did you conduct an insanity evaluation? No. And would you need to do an insanity evaluation before you could re render opinions with regards to Mrs. Stouck's sanity at the time of the crime? Absolutely. So you can't do that, right? Right. All right, I wanna make sure everyone knows that before we go forward. Uh, so let's talk about the competency evaluation for this particular case. Uh, what did you receive in preparation for your competency evaluation? I received the court order. 
I received the previous evaluation. I received discovery in the case, which was voluminous, um, included videos. I received geomedical records and um, recordings of geo phone calls between Ms. Stoke and other parties. A lot of information, I take it. A lot of information. There was a, a large amount of police reports and what's called discovery in this case. Did you review all of that? Yes. Uh, now, there's been reference to the DSM-5, the diagnostic manual that I think everyone knows that psychologists and psychiatrists use to evaluate people. Within that manual, would you find competency? No. Is that a medical diagnosis? No. Is that a legal term? Yes. What about insanity? Same. Legal term? Legal term. It's not in the DSM-5? No. So how do you go about determining whether or not someone's competent to proceed? What do you what do you look for? Kind of run the jury through that process. So the statute outlines what a competency proceed a competency to proceed evaluation entails. Um, the requirements are that the defendant needs to have the ability to have a factual and rational understanding of the proceedings, and also to have a, an ability to consult with their attorney to assist in their defense. So in pursuit of that, I would conduct a clinical interview, um, look at their current mental status, ask them very specific questions about the legal process and their case in order to establish whether or not they had that understanding and ability, and if not, why not? And that why not has to relate to a mental illness. And so why is it that you need to look at the police reports and the discovery in, in a criminal case in conjunction with talking to whoever's being evaluated? So in order to assess whether the defendant has a rational and factual understanding of the proceedings that includes their case, I have to understand their case well enough to know whether or not they understand their case. And so prior, um, I'm assuming uh, you eventually sat down with Ms. Stout and had a forensic interview with her? Yes. Uh, prior to that, did you review the materials in this case, the police reports and so forth? Yes. Did you have any concerns um, about Mrs. Stouck's credibility going into that present forensic interview? Um, credibility is always something to consider in a criminal case. There's always high stakes, especially in a case like this. Um, there seemed to be a lot of inconsistencies in the records that I was reviewing that made me question uh, what kind of presentation she was going to have when I met with her. And I should have asked you this before, but do you recall when you got the court order to do the evaluation? Um, I know it's in my report, the date of the orders in my report. I don't know off the top of my head. If your report was filed on January 7th of 2021, uh, obviously it would have been sometime before that. Yes, I met with Ms. Dyke in December 2020. So the order would have come in probably Sometime a month or two before frame. then. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so the, you said you met with Ms. Stalk on December of 2020. Uh, do you see Ms. Stalk in the courtroom today? Could you please point her out and describe what she's wearing? Uh, she's sitting in between two attorneys with teal. Okay. May the record reflect identification of the defendant subject to cross-examination? The record will so reflect. Go ahead. Uh, how long did you meet with Ms. Stalk? I met with her for about three hours and 40 minutes. And did you meet with her one time or on different times? I met with her once. And uh, could you just give, uh, I know it's a long process of the, of the forensic interview, but could you give the jury um, a, a little idea of how the interview started and what your first impressions were of Ms. Stauff when you started the forensic interview? Um, so whenever I sit down with a, a defendant, I give them a notification of purpose. Um, because it's a court-ordered evaluation, they don't really have the ability to not participate. They can choose not to participate. I still have to do an evaluation of that person. <clears throat> so I explain that there's no confidentiality, that I'm not there to help them. I'm here to help the court. Uh, what's going to happen with the report that I get, those kind of things. Um, and then I check to make sure that she understood what I had to say that, and she understood the context of our meeting and she indicated that she did. Um, she made some complaints, I believe, about her attorneys and feeling it was a conspiracy, um, but understood what we were doing. And then I proceeded to ask her back, background questions, trying to establish what her social mental health history had been 
in order to give some context to the current day. Um, and that took a long time. Um, Ms. Stouck is very verbose and likes to expand on her answers. Um, so the interview took a long time. Um, and then I had some concerns based on the prior testing from the original evaluation where she produced invalid results on some tests and the inconsistencies that I was seeing both in the records and in meeting with her um, that I administered some tests to assess for the genuineness of her responding. And then I proceeded with the legal questions at the end. Based on your uh, history in this profession, um, I would imagine that you've seen people with some serious mental illness. We talked about the post-traumatic stress uh, disorders that our soldiers have when they come back from their, um, Afghanistan and things like that. Uh, did you note any of that on your initial impression of Ms. Stout? Uh, did I note what specifically? Whether or not she had a severe mental illness based on your initial conversation. Um, no, I did not believe she had a severe mental illness. Had you seen that in your past where you're treating someone and the moment you see them, you know something's off? For instance, you might be experiencing some sort of psychosis or things like that. Yes, sometimes it's very obvious from the get-go and sometimes it takes some time. Could you give the jury an example of something that you've seen in your past where right away you knew there was some psychosis going on? Uh, sometimes as soon as somebody steps into the room, they're already having a conversation that you're not part of. Um, and you try to interrupt them and orient them to what is happening. And it's as if you're not there. Um, and the things that they're talking about are not apparently real. Conspiracies, people following them, all kinds of things. Did you see anything like that with Ms. Stauk when you initially started talking to her? Um, she engaged in some behaviors um, I, I think I mentioned in my report that she was humming to herself. She was putting her head on the wall. Um, her affect, which is what her expression of emotion, didn't really seem to fit what was happening. She seemed happier than she should have been. Um, and she, at some point, turned around to talk to somebody else and then turned around to tell me what was happening. What was that all about? Um, she said that she was talking to a vampire and then resume conversation with me. We're gonna talk about the vampires later in your testimony. Uh, earlier, you indicated that you had some concerns about some prior psychological testing with regards to your interview with Ms. Stout. Could you expand on that? What did you mean and what were, what were these psychological testing that you had concerns with? Um, so the previous evaluators had um, administered an MMPI and a PAI um, I can say what those are if you need them for the record. Sure, why don't we talk about that? First, we're hearing about it. Um, the MMPI is a Minnesota multiphasic personality interview. Um, I think they gave version two or two revised format, I'm not sure. And the PAI is a personality assessment inventory. Um, so those are long um, kind of forced choice uh, self-report measures to look for psychopathology, any mental illness, um, symptoms that people are experiencing. And you can answer them in such a way, there's uh, what we call validity scales, which assess how genuinely you're responding. And you can answer in such a way that the protocols are not interpretable because um, it appeared somebody was trying to make themselves look worse than they were, or they were answering in a way that most people don't answer. And that's what happened with mistakes. And and do you recall reading a, well, I don't, is there a computer printout that's associated with the answers that Ms. Stout gave uh, talking about the various scales and whether or not she's feigning um, psychological symptoms, that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, you, you can get a computer printout of the results, yes. And do you recall what the printout said with regards to the MMPI-2 that Ms. Stout did with the prior evaluators? Um, I just remember it was uninterpretable because it was invalid responding. Do you know whether or not she, based on the psychological testing, and was it Dr. Torres and Dr. Gray that did the prior competency evaluation? So Dr. Torres and Dr. Gray did the prior competency evaluation. They had a colleague, Dr. Hashimoto, actually administer the tests. And is that the test that you looked at prior to your interview? Yes. 
Uh, did the results of that test indicate that her symptoms were the equivalent of someone who should have been in a psychiatric hospital? Um, various psychiatric issues? I, I don't recall that it said that specifically. Um, typically, when a protocol is uninterpretable, I don't delve too much more into that because the information you get is not, not good information you can rely on. Okay. Well, we'll ask Dr. Torres about that. Um, you indicated uh, that you reviewed materials uh, prior to this interview. Did you review uh, the notes from the men mental health staff at the jail regarding Ms. Stout prior to your interview with her? Yes. Let's talk about those for a moment. Um, why did you review those notes? Um, when you're doing a competency evaluation, you just get a snapshot in time of somebody. You know, I met with Ms. Stout for three hours and 40 minutes. Um, but she may function differently outside of that environment. So I'm looking for information on how she does in general, not just considering my observations. Um, people that have more contact with her might have different impressions, and those are important. What was your impression of the notes um, as chronologically it led up to the point where you're doing a competency evaluation, starting from the moment she went into the jail on March 5th, 2020, up until December 2020 when you're interviewed? Um, they typically indicated that Ms. Stug was complaining of anxiety and nightmares when she was receiving medications for those. I think from memory, she received those medications fairly quickly. And then in May, she had requested to come off of one of them because she didn't want to take it anymore. And the jail staff accommodated that. So she was taking one anti-anxiety medication when I met with her, which was Buspar. Um, she had consistently been observed to not have serious symptoms of mental illness. Um, there were quite frequent reviews of whether or not she was having hallucinations, complaining of hallucinations, suicidal, homicidal thoughts, those kind of things. Uh, she was consistently described as not experiencing any psychotic symptoms like that. Um, although she had filed kites um, that were rather incoherent, didn't make sense. And the staff had noted that her behavior didn't match the kites. Was there anything in the jail notes that led you to believe that perhaps she may have had a serious mental illness prior to your uh, interview with her in December of 2020? In the jail notes specifically? Um, no, she, I think when she came into the jail, she didn't report any mental health history. And as her stay progressed, she started making comments about having been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, PTSD and uh, multiple personality disorder, as she called it, but that didn't feature until November. And was that after she had raised competency in this case? Yes. Sir, I'm gonna object to the term that Ms. Stout raised competency that was raised by her prior attorneys. Did you also review uh, Ms. Stout's jail calls, or at least some of her jail calls that she had with various people while she was incarcerated. I did. And why did you review the jail calls? Um, it, it allows me to extend my observations of her um, in a somewhat more natural context where she's not interfacing with a mental health professional, but she's talking to people that she knows. Um, and the whole point of reviewing all these different sources of information is looking for consistency. If someone is impacted by something, you would expect them to be consistently impacted by that, depend, like not dependent on the context. So um, that's the purpose of reviewing those things. I wanna come back to the vampires now that we're talking about the jail calls. Uh, did you know about Ms. Stout's conversations about vampires based on the jail calls that you listened to uh, prior to meeting her in December, 2020? Um, there was not a lot of content in the jail calls. I believe maybe one or two contained some statements, um, but not to the degree that she discussed with me. What did you find relevant about the jail calls that you listened to? Um, there was some inconsistency between who she was talking to and what she was saying. Um, she was talking to people and saying illogical things. Um, saying that she wasn't doing well, um, losing her mind, those kind of things, and then consecutively calling her daughter and giving her very clear instructions on how to manage bank accounts, job interviews, what can you get for me, 
very clear, coherent requests um, that didn't make sense. And, and were these phone calls you said consecutive, consecutively, are they literally back to back? One moment she's talking crazy to someone, next moment she's talking to Harley, her daughter, and having a normal conversation? Certainly on the same day. Earlier, you testified that uh, in a competency evaluation, you look at the statute and you make a determination of where you're going to go within that statute, I take it. That's a bad question. I'm going to rephrase it. Uh, going into the competency evaluation, are you looking to diagnose her with a mental illness? Um, it's required for a competency evaluation to include a diagnosis. I don't go into a competency evaluation to diagnose someone. Some people don't have diagnoses. Um, but I'm simultaneously looking at their competency related abilities and whether or not they're experiencing any mental health symptoms and formulating as I go along um, whether or not there's an, a barrier to them being able to meet the requirements to proceed. Are you essentially gathering facts, looking at those facts and weighing those facts to what the law is with regards to competency and then rendering opinion back to the court? Yes. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, that's much more succinctly than I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, so during this interview, what are you looking for when you're talking to her? Uh, and why do you not rely on everything she's telling you with regards to vampires and other things that we're going to talk about? Um, for the reasons I mentioned, it's a forensic evaluation. There's often mot motivation to present yourself a certain way to achieve a certain outcome. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to weigh what her experience is, what others have experienced with her. My goal is always, is there a barrier to competency? That's really all I'm looking for. Um, can you do this? If not, why not? And earlier you mentioned um, some things that were mentioned in the jail notes, uh, but did Ms. Stout tell you what she felt her mental illnesses were? I don't, well, she mentioned bipolar disorder to me. Um, she did not ever say to me, I have dissociative identity disorder. And she told me briefly about some trauma she'd experienced, but I don't remember her explicitly stating I have PTSD. Let's talk about the bipolar disorder first. Uh, did you do anything to either uh, diagnose her with that or rule it out or... What'd you do with the bipolar disorder information? So I noticed from the first competency evaluation, they offered a rule out diagnosis of bipolar disorder, which means that there's not enough information to say yes or no. So I considered that in meeting with her and um, bipolar disorder was something she mentioned in the jail record. And it's something she mentioned to me um, as part of all competency evaluations. I go through many different symptoms of disorders to see what somebody might be experiencing that they don't know is a mental illness. Um, she said she was bipolar and described um, being impulsive all her life and being hyper, um, having mania, as she called it, for like a few minutes to a few hours. And those are not consistent with a bipolar illness. Needless to say, you didn't diagnose her with bipolar disorder? Um, I, I, excuse me. So the, the first evaluators offered a rule out, and in my evaluation, I ruled it out saying I did not believe she had that. You mentioned uh, disassociated identity disorder. Um, how did that come up in your conversation uh, with Ms. Stout? Uh, she mentioned two instances whereby she asserted that she had found herself in places that she hadn't planned on being. And um, she also told me that she had uh, various different personalities and she named them for me. Let's talk about the personalities first. What personalities did she name to you that she had? Um, she named Taylor, Keisha, Jasmine, and I believe Jasper. Okay. I'm sorry, Taylor, Jasmine, Tisha, and uh, Jasper. Jasper. Okay. Uh, did she ever mention Victoria? No. Did she ever mention Harmony? No. 
Did she ever mes- mention Christina? No. Little Lucia? No. What about Maria Sanchez? No. So as she's saying these things, these things to you, uh, did you see any signs that she was changing personalities or turning into someone she's not? No. Based on what she's telling you, did you consider disassociative identity disorder as a diagnosis? I considered it. Tell the jury about that. What did you consider and what did you do to either diagnose her with it or rule it out or however you approach that? Um, Dissociative identity disorder is a very rare disorder. Somewhere between zero and 1% of people have it. Um, It's a very destructive, disabling disorder. People tend to be very high consumers of mental health services when they have DID. Um, It can be very frightening because people don't know what's happening to them. They feel very strange and they can't explain what that is. So there's a lot of mental distress that goes along with that. Um, And those people typically have very poor functioning, can't hold down jobs, can't hold down relationships, just not, not very productive. In talking with Ms. Stouck, she did not describe any such dysfunction. Her history didn't support that. And in describing the alters, which is what those different personalities are clinically referred to, um, she had selected names for them based on things she liked and aspirations she had, um, which is inconsistent with this disorder where typically the alters present themselves to you. You don't create them and you don't name them kind of whimsically. Um, So I just didn't see any of the impairment that would be expected to go along with the claims that she was making. If you wouldn't mind pulling that microphone a little closer to you, um, just to make sure everyone can hear you. Sorry, the chair is tilted and... The microphone moves, the chair doesn't. Okay, is that better? Happened to everybody else, it's okay. (laughs) So, can you expand on this disorder? What have, have you seen anyone with this disorder in your career? I don't believe I've ever seen anyone with DID. Based on what do you base your opinions on then? Uh, is it the DSM five and research? Research. Uh, is this a type of disorder that would be hidden from relatives and family members? Uh, I mean, with the expected dysfunction that I described. I don't know how somebody would be that impacted by a disorder and nobody would know something was wrong. And is it based on what you've read and your experience, is it common for family members to actually seek help for someone who's having blackouts and not knowing what's happening and forget, you know, things, significant things are happening in their lives. They're not able to function because of this type of stuff. I would certainly expect that there would be some intervention sought. You see any of that with Ms. Stout? Um, I wasn't provided any information to suggest that she had been a high consumer of mental health services or that anybody had concerns along those lines. And just so we're clear, uh, in a competency evaluation, Does it end with a diagnosis of a mental disorder? No, I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, in your evaluations, or if you diagnose someone with, let's say, schizophrenia, is that the end of the evaluation? You say, oh, she's got, or she or he's got schizophrenia, we stop. Okay, I understand, sorry. Uh, No, absolutely not. Um, So the... The profession of psychology considers mental illness, but the statute, the legal system considers mental disability. So I'm assessing for a mental disability. And the difference between those two is a mental illness um, is what you've heard of, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. Within those disorders, everybody's going to experience them differently. So if two people are diagnosed with depression, you don't know what their experiences are or how impaired they are. Um, A mental disability says, okay, They have a mental illness, but they're disabled by it. So it's to a high degree. It's not sufficient to have an illness. It has to be impacting functioning and that um, in a specific way for competency. And that renders it a mental disability. 
And is that the same for an insanity evaluation? Does it end with a mental illness diagnosis or do you have to go further similar to what you talked about in the competence? It's a slightly different definition, but yes, it's not sufficient to just have a mental illness. I just want to talk about the vampires some more. Did, did you talk to Ms. Stauk about her experience with vampires during your forensic interview? I did. Tell the jury about that. Um, Ms. Stauk introduced a vampire called Justice. Um, she said that there was a button in her cell that she could summon um, Justice, Jasper, perhaps Patrick, if I remember correctly. Um, she said she had been introduced to vampires when she lived in Alaska previously. And they used to go door to door like Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, she didn't really offer them in any kind of meaningful way, like wasn't explaining anything or trying to use that information necessarily. Um, but she certainly referenced them throughout the interview. Did she tell you where she got these names for these so-called vampires she's talking about? Um, she, she directed me to the movie Twilight. And did you find out that these names were from the movie Twilight or the book series yeah. involving Twilight? Yeah, a few of them for sure. I'm not familiar with the series myself, but I googled. Um, she talked about a vampire council and the name of the council was taken directly from that series. And then a couple of the names for sure came from there as well. And is that something that would be common uh, with someone who has disassociative identity disorder? that they would be able to tell you exactly where the names of other personalities came from and things like that. Um, are you drawing a connection between the vampires and DID? Because I, I got a bit confused there. No, um, I'll ask you a different question. What relevance of any did that have in your evaluation? The fact that she's talking about vampires that came from a movie. Uh, well, certainly if somebody's talking about vampires and that appears real to them that could signify that they're experiencing a mental illness so I looked further to see I'm looking for consistency again so it was notable that she said that she had been interfacing with these vampires since Alaska uh, but she made no mention of them to the previous evaluators um, and she also didn't mention them throughout her jail stay until several months in um, I think I lost track of your question. I'm sorry. Well, what's the significance? Uh, it's one thing to say that I talk to vampires and I see vampires. Uh, what's the significance of her saying clarification? Well, these vampires came from a movie. Right. So, so that's not consistent with uh, a mental illness. Um, it's, it sounded like a fabrication. Um, if people are talking to vampires, I would expect them to have uh, their own unique aspects to them and something unique to the individual that would make sense in a greater scheme of how they see the world. And it just seemed like she was conveying a story essentially from fiction. And did she bring this up on her own or did you ask her questions that might trigger that answer? I didn't ask her any questions about vampires initially. Okay. And I forget the term you used to describe how she was talking to you, but she likes to talk for lack of a better way to say it, right? Yes. Uh, would she just volunteer information to you and change subjects as you're talking to her? Um, she didn't change subjects a whole lot. I didn't get the impression from her that she wasn't following my line of thought. She was telling a coherent story. She just gave far more information that, than was necessary to answer the question. Okay. Did you perform any psychological testing with Ms. Stout? I administered two measures to assess for genuine responding for her mental illness symptoms. And what were those measures? Uh, the MFAST, which is a Miller Forensic Assessment of Symptoms Test, and the SIRS-2, which is a Structured Interview of Reported Symptoms. And what were the results of those psychological tests? Um, so she exceeded the cutoff on the MFAST. It's a screening measure for feigning, um, and feigning means the intentional exaggeration or production of mental illness symptoms. Um, so she, she crossed over the threshold indicating that she might, in fact, be feigning, but because it's a screening measure and it wasn't 100% sure, I gave another more comprehensive measure. Um, on that measure, she, there's several scales. It looks at different aspects of feigning. Are you um, reporting symptoms that you're not manifesting observable uh, behavior of? Are you reporting inconsistent symptoms, uh, rare combinations of symptoms? Um, so she just elevated one scale on that test, um, suggesting probable feigning. 
um, but on the test overall, it was indeterminate. In your report, it indicates uh, that she yielded a total score of 12. Do you remember what test that was on? That was on the MFAST. And what does that mean to you as a psychologist? So the, the cutoff in the manual is six. So if you score anything above six, it's presumed feigning. But because it's a screening measure, there's a lot of false positives. So they suggest you do more testing um, unless, so it's out of 25. If somebody scores over 16, um, it's like a 100% rate of also elevating the SIRS. So at 16, you don't have to give the SIRS as well. Um, so 12, it was certainly elevated. I had concerns, but I, I wanted to be thorough. I didn't want to just, um, it's a very um, prejudicial term to say somebody's feigning or malingering. Sure. So um, I just was being prudent. Well, in your report, you indicate that such a score is highly suggestive of malingered psychopathology and indicates the need for further assessment. What did you mean by that? Uh, and that's taken from the manual. So because it is high, um, most people don't get that score by accident. However, because it's a screening measure, it's not very sensitive. It, it, you're going to get false positives. It's going to, people are going to look like they're feigning when they're not feigning um, in that scoring range. So that's why more testing is done. What does the term malingering mean? Um, malingering, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, Malingering is like feigning where you're intentionally exaggerating your symptoms, but with malingering, there's an added element of the presumption of, um, of trying to obtain a secondary gain. Did you see that in this case? Um, it certainly seemed that Ms. Stoke was presenting symptoms that she didn't appear to have. Um, I can never know if somebody is trying to achieve a goal or not. Um, so I didn't offer an opinion on malingering. Um, but certainly there were suggestions that she was not as impaired as she was portraying. Good. Did you diagnose Ms. Stauk with anything or any mental uh, disorder out of the DSM-5 as a result of your competency evaluation? Uh, my diagnostic impressions were that she had some personality dysfunction, um, both with traits of borderline personality and narcissistic personality, but not meeting threshold for either full disorder. And I offered a rule out of PTSD versus an unspecified anxiety disorder. Um, I just didn't have enough information. And given that it wasn't a clinical information and I wasn't there to help her, I didn't want to probe too much into her trauma. Did that have any impact on your ultimate conclusion with regard to competency, either of these diagnoses? Uh, well, those diagnoses would not really reach the threshold of a mental disability. Is that why you didn't go further and try to rule out post-traumatic stress? Uh, whether or not she had post-traumatic stress, she did not demonstrate functional impairment as it related to competency. So it, for my purposes, it wasn't important. Okay. So what does it mean when you say other specified personality disorder with borderline and narcissistic features? Can you break that down for the jury? So personality disorders, um, just like other clinical disorders, have certain criteria that need to be met. And um, you have to have so many. I, um, I believe there might be seven, and you have to have five of seven for each one. So in my impressions of her, uh, she had a couple of features of borderline personality disorder. Um, she was impulsive. She had some kind of push-pull relationships, you know, um, I don't know what Dr. Moore testified to yesterday, but there was um, insisting that she saw Dr. Moore and then Dr. Moore would show up and she'd refuse to see her. That's quite consistent with a borderline personality. And the same for narcissistic personality. Um, th those features are typically a sense of entitlement, grandiosity, a lack of empathy are three big ones. Um, Ms. Stouk, told me on two occasions during the interview that she lacked empathy and she didn't experience people's thoughts and feelings. Um, she had grandiosity throughout our meeting where she grandiosity throughout our meeting where she uh, touted her accomplishments, her intellect. Uh, she was refusing to meet with people that didn't have the highest credentials. She didn't want to meet with social workers. She wanted to meet with people with higher degrees in order to talk about her problems. Um, 
wasn't sure that she met all the criteria for the disorder. So I was just trying to convey my, my goal in an evaluation is to try to help the person reading it experience what I experienced meeting with her. Um, and her personality was very much at the forefront of our interactions. Um, so that's what I was trying to convey. Did she ever refer to you as being an actress? She made a comment. Um, she said, I think you're an actor. And then she just continued talking to me. Like, she didn't really have the concern. Was that about the time you were introducing yourself and saying what your role was? Or at what point did that come up? No, it was somewhere in the middle. Okay. There's a couple things I want to talk about. Uh, the borderline, uh, uh, well, the, the, the personality disorder um, diagnosis that you have in your report. Um, are you familiar with the term transient episodes of psychosis? Yes. What is that and what does that mean? <laughs> um, well, transient means it comes and goes. Um, the psychosis, part of the DSM, the psychosis that can go along with borderline personality disorder is typically related to fears of abandonment. The disorder itself is an attachment disorder where people, um, the, the primary goal is to not feel abandoned. Um, so there's these desperate attempts to keep people in your life um, at the same time pushing them away. So the, the transient episodes of psychosis that the DSM refers to is kind of a paranoia about abandonment that might manifest like you text your loved one, they don't text back as quickly as you think they should, and you start thinking that they're leaving you. And then you go into a spiral thinking that the relationship is over, and then they text you again, and they were busy, and then you're like, oh, I'm fine now. That would be considered a transient episode of paranoia. Okay. Seems like that's pretty common, at least. <laughs> I hear about that on occasion. Um, did you see any of that with Ms. Stout during your evaluation? No. Is that something that you, well, I, are you capable of ruling that out as a symptom or being any, anything to do with Ms. Stout? Um, it wasn't something I observed during my interview. Um, she has personality dysfunction that um, I, I wouldn't say I would rule it out as ever being possible happening. I didn't see it firsthand. So it didn't come up? No. Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about what she, uh, well, let me ask you this. Did she talk about Gannon and Gannon's death? A little bit, yes. Did she talk about uh, feelings that she wanted to bring him back to life? Feeling that she could bring him back to life. Yeah, that's probably a better way to ask it. But tell the jury about that. What did, what did she say about feeling that she could bring Gannon back to life? Um, she described holding some religious beliefs based on a local pastor of a church here in Colorado Springs who um, purportedly had brought somebody back to life at some point in time. And she believed that um, Gannon could meet that same outcome based on those religious beliefs. That was kind of weird to me. I mean, what, how, did, how did that come into play in your evaluation? Uh, well, it's an unusual belief that I obviously explored further. Um, the, clinically, it kind of appeared to be a bit delusional to me. However, um, religious beliefs, by definition, are not delusions. Um, the DSM has a, an exclusion. If, if it's a commonly held belief in a subculture of religion, then it's not a delusional belief. So I chalked it up to subscribing to religious beliefs that weren't in the mainstream. Did she talk to you about her upbringing in North Carolina and her religious beliefs as a child as she's brought up in North Carolina? No. Okay. Uh, did she talk to you about Tupac? Briefly. <laughs> what did she say about Tupac? Um, at the same time that she was talking about um, Gannon being able to come back to life, she also said she believed in the conspiracy of Tupac Shakur not being dead, actually. And Tupac Shakur is who? I, I, he was a rap artist that was famously murdered in a very public way. And so was this in conjunction with talking about Gannon, uh, possibly bringing him back to life based on what the conspiracy was going on with Tupac and his murder? Yes.
Are you familiar with what diagnosis Dr. Gray and Dr. Torres uh, gave Ms. Stauk in their first competency evaluation? In their first competency evaluation, yes. Is it similar to what your diagnosis was? I believe it was very similar, except they had the added rule out of bipolar disorder. Is that a coincidence or did you tell us about how that might happen? Uh, did you consult with them at all on your diagnosis or was your diagnosis independent of what their diagnosis was? I did not consult with them. Um, you know, you would hope that when several mental health professionals meet with someone, there's going to be consistency across what they believe. That's what the DSM is for. It helps to guide us, gives us a common language to talk about things. Um, you know, my impression of Ms. Stout was that she had heavier narcissistic features than borderline. Um, I'm not sure what the other doctor's impressions were, but we, we saw the same constellation of symptoms. Was that surprising to you that you had the same diagnosis than they did? No, it, it happens often. Okay. If I can just have a second, Your Honor. You may. I want to ask you a question about um, some phrasing in your report and just expand on that. Uh, on page 22 of your report, you indicate that her presentation is better explained by the maladaptive features of her personality, which includes efforts to control her situation and obtain emotional relief. Do you recall saying that in your report? Yes. What is that? Uh, what does that mean? Is it okay if I refer to my report? Absolutely. Page 22, last paragraph. So the, the maladaptive features of her personality that I'm referring to are the, the borderline and narcissistic personality characteristics that I've outlined. Um, can you point me to the paragraph? Sure. It's the last paragraph on page 22. Uh, it would be the second sentence in that paragraph. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, so the, the symptoms that she was presenting to me, like having the personalities and having conversations with vampires, um, all, all the things that we've talked about so far seem to be an effort to achieve something for her. Um, and, and my impression was that she was trying to feel better. Um, she was trying to make sense of her situation. She was trying to deal with the reality of her situation. Um, and considering that context, that seemed a better explanation of why she was making these efforts to portray herself in certain ways um, to, meet, to meet that goal um, because of her personality structure it wasn't in a very perhaps methodical or logical way um, it wasn't perhaps ideal for her to get what she needed um, but people with personality dysfunction don't tend to do things in a straight line um, I do, it was just there was an absence of mental health mental illness but some behavior that i needed to explain In your opinion, did Ms. Stouk have a mental disability or developmental disability that prevented her from understanding what's going on in the court courtroom? No. Uh, did that? Did she have a mental disability or developmental disability that prevented her from working with her attorneys and proceeding forward in the court case? In my opinion, no. And is that why you came up with the ultimate conclusion within your report? Uh, the ultimate conclusion that she was competent to proceed, and it's an opinion. The court right. has the ultimate conclusion. <laughs> Good point. Uh, that was your opinion? Yes. And it was based on uh, everything that we talked about just now? Yes. Is there anything else significant that you would like to share with the jury about your evaluation of Ms. Stout? I can't think of anything. Okay. If I can just have a second, Your Honor. There's one thing I, I forgot to cover with you, and uh, disassociative identity disorder, 
the first part of that is disassociation. Could you tell the jury what that is and what that means from your standpoint? Um, dissociation is kind of losing track of the present momentarily. Um, it can manifest in a variety of ways. Uh, many of you have probably experienced driving down the highway and finding yourself passing an exit and you don't remember the three exits prior. That's dissociation. You're still focused, you're still driving, you're still being safe, but your attention was somewhere else. So that would be kind of an adaptive, benign experience. Um, in the extreme, dissociation happens um, maybe in the context of a trauma that's occurring where the physical body is being exposed to something very terrible and the mind is able to go somewhere else to separate itself so to not have to experience what the body is experiencing. And I imagine you may have seen some severe uh, disassociating features with some of the soldiers that you evaluated early on in your career with some post-traumatic stress issues that were going on during BAP, for lack of a better word. Is yes. That, is that kind of what you're talking about, those severe versus everyday disassociations that we may experience? Yeah, <clears throat> just with, with anything, um, most things in the DSM, they're all symptoms. We all experience most of them. They become a problem when they impact your functioning. So dissociation is a normal thing when you're doing repetitive things. Um, it's a problem when it starts interfering with your life. Um, when you're needing to be somewhere and psychologically you're somewhere else or it's causing a lot of distress for you. Thank you, Jan. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Cross-examination. Thank you. Dr. Grimmett, how are you? Good morning. Good. Thank you. Kind of, don't get in the water, so gosh. I kind of pick up where Mr. Young left off and talking about disassociation you know in general and i think you said it's everybody to some degree disassociates from time to time yes and how the mind does it or the exact mechanisms it, it, it's somewhat unclear but it somewhat has to do at least my understanding is it's where memories are stored and so memories may be stored in a place that's not necessarily easily retrievable um, I'm not sure that's specific to dissociation, but that does happen. Yes. Um, I, I guess I would need a clearer question. Well, I guess, for, for example, um, one part of disassociation is, you know, a person comes home, you know, from work, they immediately get into a heated argument with their spouse, and they can't remember where they left their car keys. Um, but sometimes if they may go back to that emotional state of anger, then they may be able to, that memory may be more accessible to them. Yeah, there's a specific term for that. It's called state dependent learning, okay. where you can go back to the state you're in when you did something to try to remember the thing you forgot. Okay. Yeah. And is that a type of disassociation? Uh, it's a, an encoding issue with memory. Okay. So it's a, a memory issue. I'm not sure that it would be dissociation. I'm not an expert on dissociation. Okay. Um, I'm not sure it'd be classified as a memory or a dissociation issue, but it's certainly a process that happens. Well, and, and dissociation is an occurrence that happens with post-traumatic stress disorder or CAN. CAN, yes. And it's, to some degree, it's a defense mechanism. Yes. When the, a person is confronted with trauma um, at that point in time that they're just not capable of dealing with. Yeah, it works in two directions. It can yeah. be a, an adaptive escape or it can be you dissociate to a bad place it's, yeah i mean so sometimes it's it's beneficial and then sometimes it can be to where it's where we get to as a disorder i mean well you can think you're back in the war zone for example yeah, yeah. and kind of like the same thing um that trauma can be stored that memory of that trauma can be stored in a place and then certain things can trigger it yes smells yes times if, yeah. if it, you know, something happened like around a certain holiday, I could get closer to that holiday and I could start experience the, the stress of the trauma. And sometimes people don't even realize why they're experiencing that. Yes. Um, and that's oftentimes why, you know, veterans or other people who have experienced that type of trauma get into therapy and everything like that to try to figure out why am I behaving, you know, this way around these certain types of, for lack of a better word, trigger. Yes. And something that was beneficial allowed them to get through a traumatic you know experience then when they're taken out of that kind of uh, that traumatic experience it impacts like a day-to-day -day functioning correct their brain kind of 
reacted rationally to an irrational situation. Sure. And then when they're in rational situations, sometimes their brains act irrationally. Yes. And, and again, that's something that oftentimes people have been through traumatic, you know, one traumatic event um, can cause post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, one traumatic event can cause post-traumatic stress disorder, but most don't. And what's the difference between post-traumatic stress disorder and complex post-traumatic stress disorder? Complex post, I'm going to say PTSD. Or PTSD. <laughs> okay. Uh, complex PTSD um, typically refers to repeated trauma more than just one single incident. Okay. And I mean, in a, you know, hypothetical example of a woman, a grown adult woman who is sexually assaulted by a stranger, that can cause PTSD. It can. It can. Now, and let's get this straight. And I think the jury may have some questions. Trauma affects people differently, correct? Yes. Some people, and there's, we don't know why, there's a lot of different theories. Some are genetic. Why trauma affects people differently. I just, you can't, I know it's easier because we're having a conversation to nod your head, but you have to say yes because she's well, taking it down. I wasn't sure you were asking me a question. Okay. So I'm just like gesturing, but yeah. if you need a response, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> some, one of the factors that can impact how somebody deals with stress can be genetics. I, I believe, well, it, neurobiology, I'm not sure yeah. that it's passed down from generation to generation. Okay. Also can be if, well, um, upbringing can impact how somebody can handle trauma, correct? Yes. If other, if there are other kind of anchors, um, people or places in their lives that can help somebody handle trauma. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if somebody, for example, um, a woman is, is sexually assaulted, but she has, you know, a strong community. She has a strong family around her. She has support, other, you know, support groups and everything like that. That can help her deal with trauma better than somebody who is isolated and alone. Yeah, I mean, some people are just more predisposed to having trauma. Okay. Um, but most people who are exposed to traumatic events don't get PTSD. Yes. <clears throat> And when we're talking about disassociative identity disorder, most of the literature indicates that that is a response to overwhelmingly child sexual, child sexual trauma. Yes. And the basis kind of for that are in, in the literature and the thinking of how this develops is you have a child who is herped on by a caregiver is the kind of classic example of it. Uh, I, I don't know that I have looked into the literature to that degree. Um, childhood sexual abuse is certainly problematic. I haven't looked at perpetrator literature. Mm -hmm. Well, in a, for a child who is perpetrated on by a caregiver, creates a problem for that child. Right. I, because you have somebody, because kids are not self-sufficient, correct? Correct. They rely upon a caregiver to give them food, correct? Correct. They rely upon a caregiver to give them a shelter, yes. correct? And we've learned more and more in the last 20 or 30 years, they also rely upon that caregiver for, you know, emotional support. Right. And that, and we may, we'll get into that a little bit, attachment theory and so forth, but that's actually a need of, you know, young children is emotional support from a caregiver. Yes. And so a child who is, perpetrated on, who was molested by a caregiver, the point behind, or the theory behind DID is they disassociate. And so the memories of the perpetration and the molestation go into one place. And then there's another personality or ego or ego state that doesn't have that memory. And so can look to that caregiver for the food, shelter, and emotional support. Are you aware of that? That, aware. that? That's the theory behind. DID. I'm aware of that theory, yes. Okay. And therefore, it's basically a defense mechanism that would allow a child to survive and to be able to function in a horrible situation. Yes, dissociation would be an adaptive function. An adaptive function of that thing. And the literature, especially, I mean, when you're talking about, you know, sex assaults in general, it's generally thought of that it is more traumatic 
for an individual who is um, aggrieved or who is molested, who is sexually assaulted by a family member or something like that, that is generally considered more traumatic than by a stranger. Someone in a position of trust, yes. That, that, that causes, you know, long-term, can cause long-term mental health issues. It can, yes. And just to be clear, not every kid who is sexually assaulted or perped on by an adult develops a serious mental illness. Correct. Some of them are able, for whatever reasons, to adapt and, and overcome and lead a relatively normal life. Correct? Yes. While others can, based upon the trauma suffered as a child, um, develop serious mental illnesses. Yes. And when we're talking about, you know, disassociation and kind of alter ego states, it, more and more we are understanding that everything is a continuum. I mean, mental illness. Men, all, all mental illness. And all, I mean, we, you think we said before, I mean, everybody disassociates to a degree. And then it becomes a problem where it becomes a mental illness with it's interfering with day-to-day -day life. Right. And the same is kind of, you know, we all, everybody to a degree has some different either ego states or personas that they put on. Uh, I mean, that's very common, yes. Very Well, when I walk in here, I got my tie on, I'm going to talk professionally, I'm going to try to act smart. That may be a very different persona than I act with my kids. And it's not something that, especially once you've done it a bunch of times, you even have to think about it. I don't have to be up here thinking, be lawyer persona, be lawyer persona. I walk in, I've got my tie, everybody's looking. I slide in to that role. Right, that's a conscious process. Though. A conscious process, yes. Right. And when you get what disassociative identity disorder is, to some degree, somebody who doesn't have control of sliding in between those the different roles, they, they lack, I don't want to say capacity, but they lack control over that. They, they can slip in and out of the different personas without the ability to necessarily control that. Well, it would be an unconscious choice. An unconscious choice, yes. And they also lack the, or the thought, at least in the DSM and a lot of the literature, is they lack the ability to access some of the memories that the other persona has. Uh, I think there's some variation with that, but yes, that, that, that can happen. That, the, one persona is keeping all the bad memories to itself, and so the other persona can function in real life. In theory, yes. In theory, that's what, and that's, there's literature in the DSM-5, that's what the DSM-5 indicates. Sure. Okay. And again, it only becomes a disorder when that what was a defense mechanism or a coping mechanism begins impacting day-to-day -day life. That's when it, it goes into the disorder. When it causes functional impairment. Yes. Functional impairment. It causes something like a person's not able to hold down a job for a long period of time. Yes. It causes uh, problems when they have um, inability to have a long-term relationship with people. Yes. When it causes them to have uh, problems with family members and so forth. And you never, I wasn't the one, and this is so that the jury understands, um, we're not Miss Stouch's first set of attorneys. You're, you understand that? Oh, yes. Yeah, it, it eventually you were uh, requested by a woman by the name of Kitty Strobel. Yeah, the Public Defender's Office. Yeah. And did they provide you any type of work history of Miss Stouch? Um, I had some data. Um, I think just specifically, there was some letters from Dr. Niederhauser referencing work. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to those later. Okay. But I mean, just, you know, generally a life history, whether or not she's had trouble maintaining a job, whether or not she's constantly been changing jobs, that type of stuff. That no, was I, don't, I don't think you. they provided me that. Okay. And that may be something that you talked about might be relevant towards either disassociative disorder or borderline personality disorder. If somebody who constantly cannot hold down a job that can be symptomatic of either one of those diagnoses or can be evidence of it, not in and of itself, but circumstantial evidence. Well, of and, it. and many other things. So sure. it's an important thing to ask about. Yes. Absolutely. Is what type of mental illnesses are comorbid with disassociative identity disorder? 
um, so comorbid fees that are happening at the same time. Um, I just wanted to see so hard. <laughs> you did. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> dissociative identity disorder, uh, PTSD, borderline, bipolar, dis well, sometimes it's confused with bipolar disorder. I don't think it's comorbid with it. Um, anxiety disorders. Okay, and you are aware that Ms. Stout had been diagnosed with a general anxiety disorder? I am aware she reported that. Okay, well, I mean, you're aware that the jail was actually prescribing her medication for anxiety? Yes. Well, and you're aware from a letter from Dr. Niederheiser that she was suffering from anxiety and stress? Yes. And that was a letter that um, was dated a couple months before the events in question? Yes. Another possible indication of dissociative identity disorder is self-injury? Um, not just DID, but yes. Yeah, I mean, that. I'm just talking something that the DSM-5 lists as something that occurs in a, generally, you would, you can see, can be evidence of DID, and that would be self-injury is one of the things that DSM-5 indicates. I'm actually not aware of that. What about suicide attempts? Um, I have the, I don't have the DSM-5 memorized, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't know the, the full extent of the criteria. I obviously reviewed them as part of my evaluation, but I haven't memorized them, and I, I don't want to say yes or no to symptoms that I'm not clear on. Um, if I may approach. You may. Okay. I'm on page 294. Yes. And if you could look at the associated features supporting a diagnosis of disassociated identity disorder. Thank you. Okay, and so self-injury, anxiety, all those things can be associated with disassociated identity disorder. Yes. May I approach? May. Thank you. You are also aware that the DSM-5 indicates only a small percentage of people with DID present in a manner that somebody would see the shifts in personas. Yes. And so, you know, asking individuals who maybe have talked with Ms. Stouch for an hour or so who don't know her, if they've noticed changes in her personality, would not necessarily be that relevant in determining whether or not she has this social identity disorder. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't be very reliable. Yeah, I mean, it would be kind of misleading to indicate that somebody with this associated identity disorder is going to be changing personas multiple times in a one hour conversation. Yes. That's not consistent with any literature whatsoever. Right. You also, with this associated identity disorder, impairment varies widely from apparently minimal to profound. Yes. And that's in the DSM-5. And so somebody, you know, you just said, but on direct, you're saying you would expect to have all like these problems with this social identity disorder, but the DSM-5 seems to indicate that it can be minimal disruptions or profound disruptions depending upon the individual. So I was referencing my competency evaluation. Okay. So yes. if somebody is experiencing mild symptoms of anything, it's not going to be something that presents as a barrier. So I'm looking for symptoms to a degree that they're causing functional impairment. So I, I'm offering testimony specific for the purpose of my evaluation. Okay. And many mental illnesses, or almost all mental illnesses, they fluctuate. Yes. And that's why when you're talking about competency, you're doing competency at that specific time. Yes. Because it's not static. It's not. It can, it can vary. Yes. And almost, you know, any, any, even a mental illness such as schizophrenia, can vary. Sometimes people can be in active psychosis, but you could have someone who has schizophrenia and other a month later they may look apparently normal. Yeah, we talk about symptoms waxing and waning. And how I've had experience with clients who have grown up in very traumatic, chaotic environments that are actually much more comfortable in 
jail or prison environments. And have you seen that same type of thing? Yeah, people get institutionalized and they, they well, need that structure. And sure, ask your question. Okay, let me, well, let me, let me, for example, like somebody who, again, one caregiver may be abusive. They may sometimes may not have food. They may not know what's going to go on for day to day. Jail or prison is very structured. You got, you eat at this time, you do this at this time, everything like that. Sometimes people from traumatic environments can actually be much less stressed in jail and much more adaptive in jail. Some people, yes. Yeah. And so the degree, sorry, it's thirsty. Um, as to the structure of the jail was impacting the presentation of mental illness, we don't necessarily know. Uh, I wouldn't know in the course of a competency evaluation. Sure. A lot of times people with disassociated identity disorder will try to conceal that that that's going on from other people around them. Uh, I haven't worked to my knowledge directly with people with DID, so I can't answer that. Are you aware that the literature reflects that generally people are in mental health treatment between four to six years before they're correctly diagnosed with DID? Um, I, yes, I believe it can take a long time. Are you aware that the DSM-5 indicates one of the things that leads a lot of individuals with DID to therapy initially is OCD? Uh, I think I remember reading that. Okay, and what is OCD? Obsessive compulsive disorder. What does that mean? Um, you have thoughts that are very disturbing to you that need to, that drive you to engage in a behavior to alleviate the distress of having the thought, like hand washing, germs, stuff. It's a, it's, it's a coping mechanism. To alleviate mental distress. Okay. Can it be a coping mechanism to alleviate the mental stress of childhood trauma? Um, I mean, there's there's no straight line to get to OCD, so. Okay. <laughs> it can vary, but that that's a, a realistic hypothetical. Sure. The... DSM-5, it's one, the DSM-5 is helping figure out what's wrong with the person and, and, and give them a label, correct? Right. And the, the reason for that, it's, and again, I think Mr. Young has brought this up, is not necessarily designed for the forensic setting, it's designed more for the clinical setting, that we give somebody a label, and then based on that label, this is kind of the course of treatment. Right. It's it's very much specifically for clinical treatment, and it's, it provides a common language for providers to be able to talk about, diagnose, and come up with plans for patients. But it is still relied upon to a large extent, even in a forensic setting. Well, there's a forensic caution sure. in there, um, but yes, it's, it's the only diagnostic manual we have. It's the only thing that we don't have anything else, so we have to use it, even though it's not necessarily specifically designed for that. Correct. And it has what's called... What, when it lists differential diagnoses, what is that? A differential diagnosis is if, let's say, DID is the primary diagnosis you're looking at, a differential diagnosis would be other things to consider that it could be instead. Okay. And one of the things that it lists, I mean, it lists personality disorder, and it lists specifically borderline personality disorder. Yes. And it, it specifically states that oftentimes borderline personality disorder can present similarly to DID. Yes. And you diagnosed Ms. South with a personality disorder with borderline and narcissistic features. Yes. And when we're talking personality disorders, um, those are kind of organized by clusters. Yes. And narcissistic and borderline, I think they're in the B cluster. Yes. And when we do clusters, that means we're organizing personality disorders that have some similarities. Yes. And that's how, when do we start doing the clusters? For my time. Um, so the DSM-3? It was definitely in the DSM-4-TR, which is my time. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it wasn't in the previous sessions. Okay. And we'll have other personality disorders that could be there's cluster A and there's cluster C that are kind of 
different than cluster B. Right, and we no longer have clusters in the DSM-5 TR. We don't? I don't think so. It's more of a, a dimensional continuum. You sure? I'm not for sure. Okay. I, I, if thought, the DSM I thought there were clusters. Okay. The DSM-5 still indicates cluster B. Um, would that be? If, if it indicates it, then it's correct. If I may approach. You may. Six, five minutes. Well, look at you looking smart again. Yes, you're correct. Okay. Thank you. And so cluster B, we generally, we've got antisocial, histrionic, borderline, narcissistic. Yes. Um, to your not, what is the antisocial personality disorder? Antisocial personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of breaking the law, having difficulty adapting to authority and social norms, Deception, lying, um, general rule breaking behavior. And Ms. Stouch has had multiple evaluations. She's had two competency and two sanity. I'm not familiar knowledge. with what happened after I met okay. her. Are you aware of anybody ever diagnosing her with an antisocial personality disorder? Uh, not to my knowledge. What's a psychopath? Uh, psychopath is not a diagnosis. Okay. Um, it is a person who manifests a lot of antisocial traits, uh, lack of empathy, callousness, um, kind of parasitic behavior, living off of other people. Uh, there's a specific, uh, there's specific criteria that need to be met to be diagnosed with, as a psychopath, eh, be assigned the label, but it's not a clinical diagnosis. It's not in the DSM. Nobody has ever diagnosed her or given her the label of a psychopath, to your knowledge? To my knowledge. Talk a little bit about borderline personality disorder. What is borderline personality disorder? Borderline personality disorder is a disorder of interpersonal relationships where the person has a profound fear of abandonment, um, chronic feelings of emptiness, tendency to engage in self-destructive behavior, whether it's sex, gambling, self-injury, suicidal gestures, and uh, possible transient episodes of psychosis. Okay. And similarly, border, both the underlying literature seems to indicate that both DID and borderline personality disorder are generally caused by childhood trauma. Um, I believe that for borderline personality disorder, it's not necessary or sufficient to have had childhood trauma. No, but the thought of is that childhood trauma can cause borderline personality disorder. It, it can certainly lead to it, but it's not required. It's not, re uh, yes. So DID, it's almost exclusively trauma based. Childhood trauma. I mean, most of the literature has anywhere between 94 to 100% of people with DID suffer significant childhood trauma, and it's almost always sexual childhood trauma, correct? Um, probably. Okay. And borderline personality disorder, there's a correlation, but not necessarily a direct cause. Yes. And a high degree of people with borderline personality disorder reflect childhood trauma. Yes. And some of this, at least my understanding, um, how, are you familiar with attachment theory? I mean, I've had it as part of my training. Okay. And it's, and it's Bowlby. I'm mispronouncing that. Bowlby. Bowlby. And what is attachment theory? Um, well, Bobby, <laughs> it's going back to the 60s, I think, <laughs> before yeah. my time. Um, there was research done on the damage of separating mother and infant. Um, there's a critical period between the age of zero and two where attachment with the caregiver forms of those attachments were disrupted. Um, it can affect the child's functioning going forward. And, and basically, they, they took, it was him and then a Mary Ainsworth, they took I think it was one or two year olds, children in between that age, they, they put them in a room and then they had the caregiver leave. Ainsworth did, yes. Yeah, Ainsworth did. And Ainsworth? And based upon that, and then the caregiver, Mary Ainsworth, the caregiver would be gone, I think 10, 15 minutes, and then the caregiver would re enter the room. Yes. And what they were basically able to notice is three different phenomena with the different children. 
Yes. Um, one phenoma, which they would then label secure attachment, which is what as parents we hope to be able to do with our children, is the child would be distressed and then the caregiver would return to the room and the child would be soothed. Um, I believe with secure attachment, the child was able to self-soothe before the caregiver returned. Are but you they, sure? But they were com comforted by the caregiver returning. Or would that be avoidant attachment with the child that doesn't seem to care whether the parent comes or goes? Well, I think they were still distressed, if I remember correctly. They just weren't comforted by the caregiver. Okay. Um, I, I, this has been a long time. Okay. I'm not going to argue with you. A absolutely. A any, we can find a reasonable breaking point. This is a good breaking point, Your Honor. This is good. Sure. I, I didn't want to interrupt. No. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take our morning recess. If I can have everyone back in the jury room at, say, 1040, we should be able to start on time at that point. Again, don't discuss the case among yourselves. Don't discuss the case with anyone else. Uh, don't do your own research about any aspect of the case. With that, we'll see you back at 10. All right. So the jury, please. I think you may all be seated. Dr. Grimmett, you can sit down if you would like to proceed. Thank you. Okay, recess, thank you. All rise.
versus Lakeisha Stout. Record should reflect the jury's not present in the courtroom. Um, Dr. Grimmett, uh, I remind you, ma'am, the jury is uh, still under oath. Is there anything we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? I think so. Uh, defense? Okay. No, sir. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 people versus Lakeisha Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Um, when we took our break, we were in the midst of the cross examination of Dr. Grimmett. That's where we will resume, Mr. Tolini. Yes, Dr. Grimmett. And back, we were kind of talking about attachment theory. And I'll kind of move on from the exact experiment, but what from the experiment, they basically developed three different styles of attachment uh, secure avoidant and anxious. Are you familiar with that? Yes. And secure attachment, the theory is that comes when a child grows up and they are given the appropriate attention by the parent. The child cries and the parent comes in to soothe them. The child is hungry and the parent comes in to feed them, correct? Yeah, the child perceives their needs are met. And the again, the theory behind attachment theory is that then children who grow up securely attached are then able to have secure relationships. They can have a romantic partner. They can explode, you know, romantic relationships or other relationships that actually work and are, are functional. It sets a good foundation for that. Yes. Um, people, the theory with um, avoidant attachment, people with that, and it maybe had a pair, uh, caregiver who was not attentive. The child would cry and nobody would come to soothe it. Um, the child would be hungry, nobody would feed it, and they kind of grow to put on a persona that they don't need anybody and are very kind of self-reliant and feel threatened by intimate relationships and so forth. That would be kind of the characteristics of avoidant. It could be, yes. Um, and then we have anxious, and that's somebody who, similar to the avoidant, did not have their needs met by the caregiver and they can be extremely needy in a relationship. They uh, put a lot of kind of same with, with, that's why I was getting to it. Anxious attachment would be similar to borderline personality disorder. Um, I, I think that it's it stems from an unpredictability and inconsistency yeah. with the parenting where the child doesn't know what's coming, whether they're gonna get soothed or not. There's some inconsistency there that causes some distress. And kind of back talking with borderline, that's with the romantic like relationships, they're consumed with it at the beginning and then think that it's gonna be taken away and are very threatened by the fear of abandonment. Yes. And then later on, they actually came up with disorganized attachment. Yes. And disorganized attachment is kind of the anxious, but on steroids. And that's generally thought to somebody who was traumatized by a caregiver. Uh, I'm not too familiar with that. Okay. Have you ever heard the term disorganized attachment style? Yes, I just, I could tell you what the criteria are. Okay. But, and the, so the same, you know, theory of the causes, at least back to anxious, there's some tracking and some similarities between the anxious attachment theory and borderline personality disorder. Yes. And you were, as part of the discovery that you reviewed, were you given hours upon hours upon hours of 
phone conversations between Al Stauk and Letitia Stauk that were recorded by the FBI? Uh, not hours and hours, no. Um, I did listen to some pretext phone calls, but I don't recall them being hours. Okay, you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who, in the face of a missing child or a homicide investigation, who is incredibly preoccupied with the relationship status and whether or not Al Selk is going to take her back, that would be extremely consistent with borderline personality disorder. Uh, yes. Yes. It, I mean, so where it's, it appears like this is just ir irrational, the focus on this. It's an irrational focus. I would say it's consistent with borderline personality disorder, but also may be consistent with other things. Sure, it could be consistent with narcissistic personality disorder. Right. And the, the DSM-5 itself, it, it has a ton of different categories of mental illnesses or, or symptoms of, of so forth, correct? There, there's a lot of different diagnoses in the DSM-5. Oh, yes. The DSM-5 itself doesn't, at least now, the DSM-5 especially, does not categorize one thing as a serious mental illness versus something else. Like it doesn't say schizo the DSM-5 is, let me, sorry, I cut you off. The DSM-5 doesn't say schizophrenia is a serious mental illness, but borderline personality disorder is not. That's correct. It just says these are the things we look for for these diagnoses. Right. And all the diagnoses can exist on a continuum. Yes. Somebody could have a very, I'll say mild, but, well, Bipolar disorder can be a serious mental illness, correct? I mean, it typically is a serious mental illness. But somebody could have bipolar <laughs> disorder to a degree that it does not substantially impact their life. And then, so according to the definition of the National Institute of Mental Health, would not be a serious mental illness. Um, there are mental illnesses in the field that are considered serious because of how impactful they are and bipolar disorder would be one of those you don't tend to have a mild case of bipolar disorder certainly can but yeah. it's it is typically a disabling disorder it typically but it could not be it could not be okay and that's why i'm saying that's why the dsm doesn't necessarily label it because you could also have a on the continuum a severe case of a personality disorder that can impact the day-to-day -day functioning of that person's life. Right. And if it impact, and according to the National Institute of Mental Health, if the mental illness is impacting that person's day-to-day -day life, then it is then categorized as a mental illness. Um, I don't concern myself with what the National Institute of Mental Health says for competency evaluation. Sure. So I'm, I can't really answer that. Do you know that that's what the definition by the National Institute of Mental Health is for serious mental illness? Uh, no, not, not particularly. I work off of the DSM, and because okay. I'm not providing treatment, sure. it's not relevant to okay. me day to day. Would you agree with that definition? Is a serious mental illness is a mental illness that impacts somebody's day to day life? Um, I don't know what the formal definition is, but if I'm assessing someone, no. it, I'm looking for the level of impairment in day to day life. Okay. And sometimes personality disorders can be so severe that they impact a person's day-to-day -day life. Yes. Now, I also gave you, I emailed you some articles. You did? Uh, one of those articles I'm going to be approaching with Defense Exhibit C is hallucinations and other psychotic symptoms in patients with borderline personality disorder. Yes. If I may approach. You may. And see if that's familiar. Yes. And just so everybody understands, you said one of the things that you do when you're confronted with, you know, a, a patient or something new is you do research in, in your line of profession. 
Yes. And because you no psychologist or psychiatrist has had specific hands-on experience with every type of mental illness. There's new things that come up, correct? Correct. And you do research, and where do you turn for research? To peer-reviewed journals. Peer-reviewed journals. And basically what that is, there are, well, both sometimes practicing clinicians, and there's other people in academia, and they will do studies and so forth and submit articles to peer-reviewed journals. Yes. And then those peer-reviewed journals are, there's lots of different ones in psychiatry, evidently, or psychology. And you will look at it and look to those peer-reviewed journals to inform you on certain situations. Yes. The article which I have given you, that comes from a peer-reviewed journal, correct? Yes. And it is something that would be, I'm not asking if you agree with everything in it or not, but that would be something that would be generally relied upon people in your field. It would be considered. Considered. Yes. Yes. That article indicates that they've done studies and people with borderline personality disorder can suffer psychotic symptoms. Yes. And let's, uh, let's, I want to step back here for a second. Let's talk about psychotic symptoms. Psych and Dr. Grimmett, if I'm incorrect on any of this, let me know. My understanding is there are psychotic symptoms and psychotic isn't necessarily a diagnosis itself, but there are certain symptoms that we look at to make other diagnoses in the DSM-5. Would that be accurate? Yes. And when we're talking about psychotic symptoms, we're talking about a couple different things. We're talking about delusions. Yes. And delusions are a fixed belief that is not amenable to change by evidence. Yes. And so I have this belief and no matter what you show me, what you do, I'm not changing this belief that I have. Correct. And, you know, the general delusions that everybody's are, you know, familiar with, we have delusions of grandeur, one type of delusion, grandiose delusions. Are you asking me a question? Yes. Yes. Another type of delusions would be paranoid delusions. Yes. And the delusions can, again, we, they can be on a continuum. Yes. Um, a delusion of grandeur. I mean, hypothetically, if we have the NFL draft coming up this weekend, are you aware of that? I'm not probably aware of that. not. <laughs> but you know, say somebody who hardly ever played for his college team believes that he's going to be drafted, despite everybody saying there's no way this is possible. That could be delusional. Yeah, and that would be on the low end of the spectrum. It's I'm not sure it would be considered pathological, okay. but pathological, but it's a fixed belief that delusions of grandeur are more typically thinking you hold some high status like you're Jesus. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. And then the, on the other hand is the Masonic. Okay. I'm coming here. I've been blessed to save the world. I have this specific mission. I have super smarter than everybody else. That type of thing. Right. Paranoid delusions. You know, the government's after me. They're putting stuff in my head. That would be an example of a paranoid delusion. Yes. Um, so that is one symptom of psychosis. Yes. Another symptom of psychosis would be hallucinations. Yes. And hallucinations could be auditory. Yes. And auditory hallucinations, I'm hearing voices, I'm hearing anything that is not really there. Right. Um, we have visual hallucinations. We do. Which is I'm seeing things that aren't there. Right. And sometimes I'm seeing things that aren't there and they're talking to me and that would be an auditory and a visual, visual hallucination at the same time. That's right. We can also have tactile delusions. And what is that? Feeling something on your body that's not there. Okay. <laughs> we also have, then the next thing would be disorganized thought or disorganized. You don't want to cover the rest of the hallucinations? I can. What else do we have? I thought I got I have the main ones. Well, there's, there's a couple more that you should know about. I would tell me. There's olfactory hallucinations where you smell things that aren't actually there. Okay. And there's gustatory hallucinations where you taste things that aren't there. Okay. All right. I want to make sure we have all the information. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> we also have disorganized thought. And what is that? Um, not being able to follow your own line of thinking. Um, not making sense in your thoughts and how they come out your mouth. <laughs> and, and that can also be on a continuum, correct? Uh, yes. I mean, it can go anywhere from kind of tangential thinking all the way to what's called word salad. Yes. And what is word salad? 
uh, when the words that come out your mouth are not logically connected to each word, so it sounds like you're just saying words and it's not a sentence. And tangential thinking is where somebody is jumping from one thing to another without anything necessarily connecting them. Correct. Um, and then we kind of have the other ones. We have abnormal motor behavior. And what is that? Uh, well, that can be lots of things. It might be like a stereotypic shaking. It might be picking, pilling, um, or having underactive movements where you don't respond. And then, then finally, we have the negative symptoms. And what are those? So the hallucinations and delusions are considered positive symptoms. That means there's a symptom present when you wouldn't expect there to be something. A negative symptom is when you expect to see something that's not there. So that would be under under active motor, flat affect, no change in emotional expression, a lack of energy, lack of interest, lack of engagement, apathy, those kind of things. Sometimes people who are psychotic can just sit in a room and stare into nothing for hours upon hours at a time. Yes. And we use these to make, you know, diagnoses. I mean, generally what we think about psychotic symptoms, the main diagnosis we have is schizophrenia. We have schizophrenia, bipolar disorder with psychotic features, major depression with psychotic features, or typically uh, bipolar disorder and major depression. There's depressive disorder with psychotic features are the typical ones. And there are certain criteria for somebody with psychotic symptoms for schizophrenia. I think it has to be, you have to experience psychotic symptoms for about a month and then it has to be persistent for over six months, correct? You have to have symptoms for over six months. Um, you have to have hallucinations, delusions, and um, disorganized thinking or the negative. You have to have multiple symptoms of psychosis, right. not just one. But there are lots of other mental illnesses that can cause transient psychotic features, correct? Yes. Okay. I mean, sometimes PTSD can cause transient psychotic features. Uncommonly, but yes. Okay. Uh, dissociative identity disorder can cause transient psychotic features. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. And that article indicates that people with borderline personality disorder can suffer from transient psychotic features. Yeah. And that's one of the criteria in the DSM-5. Yeah. And it indicates that between 20 to 50% of people that suffer from borderline personality disorder suffer from hallucinations. In this sample. Yes. Um, that these hallucinations can be both auditory and visual. Visual, sorry. Yes. Um, sometimes that 50% of the hallucinations had malicious content. Right. So this was a sample of 143 people. Just yes. Because you don't have the article. I know. And Mr. Young's, after I'm done, he's going to come up and you guys are going to discuss why he thinks this article is garbage. Um, but I'm just going. If I, if I may, uh, at this point, I'm going to object to this line of testimony as to irrelevant. There's nothing tying this to what she did in this case, and certainly nothing tying this to the defendant. So, well, um, first of all, um, the jury will disregard uh, counsel's statement regarding what um, Mr. Young may or may not do. Uh, as you know, counsel can't testify in this case. Nothing that they say is evidence. Um, secondly. Um, you qualified this witness uh, as a witness in uh, forensic psychiatry. Uh, psychology. Or psychology, that's right, I'm sorry. Forensic psychology. This witness has not said it's outside her expertise, so it's within her expertise. Um, uh, and there were some questions regarding the presence or absence of dissociative disorder, dissociative identity disorder. So I will allow the questioning overruled. And according to this study, 50% of the hallucinations are malicious content. I don't recall specifically, but yes. Can you direct me to where on the... <laughs> if you could look on page, the second sentence of page 790. Thank you. Yes. 50% of the hallucinations had malicious content. Yes. And so that would mean 50% of the hallucinations seem threatening to the person perceiving them. 
Yes. And I get, I think I gave you a, a couple other articles that that other from other peer reviewed journals that indicate that people with borderline personality can suffer from audio and visual hallucinations. Yes. Do you have, are you aware of any studies disputing the fact that people with borderline personality disorder can suffer from auditory and visual hallucinations? No, it's part of the criteria for the disorder. Okay. And also people with borderline personality disorder can disassociate. Um, not just from borderline personality disorder, but they may have other conditions going on that cause dissociation. Okay. According to this article that we are talking about, the hallucinations, there's kind of three different things that they look about that bring upon the hallucinations. The first one that they talk about is stress. Yes. And that periods of stress can cause somebody to, who has borderline, who has this personality disorder to slip into a psychotic state. Right, and that's not specific to the article. Again, that's the, that's, the end that's, episodes is stress related. Okay, you were provided a letter um, from December, I believe, 13th, from a Dr. Niederhauser. Yes. Indicating that she was seeing Ms. Stout. Yes. And indicating that Ms. Stout needed to resign from her work because she was suffering from stress and anxiety. Yes. Another thing, according to this article, that can impact the degree somebody with borderline personality disorder suffers psychotic symptoms is whether or not they experienced childhood trauma growing up. Can you direct me to the page again? And I'm looking at page 790. Um, so the same page that we were on, it kind of has number two or what factors influence psychotic symptoms in borderline personality disorder. The first one, it indicates stress. The second one, hallucinations, childhood trauma, and disassociation. Okay. I, I just feel like we addressed this when we were talking about the underlying factors for sure. borderline personality disorder. So I didn't perceive anything in this article to be different than what we've already discussed. That's why I feel a bit confused. Okay, no, but, but when we were discussing whether or not childhood trauma causes borderline personality disorder or whether or not it's, it's a correlation, and I think you pointed out, some people can have borderline personality disorder, but not necessarily have childhood trauma. Right. And this seems to indicate that people who have both childhood trauma and borderline personality disorder, those people seem to suffer psychotic symptoms more than people who have borderline personality disorder without childhood trauma. It's just very difficult to work through because most, most people don't experience just one sure. issue. So if they have borderline personality disorder, they usually have accompanying other dysfunction, whether it's another mental illness or other um, personality disorders. So trying to narrow it down to say this, this causes this, um, there could be a number of reasons why somebody's manifesting symptoms and me and my role would not be able to say this is coming from that. Sure. And I, and I wasn't asking that. I'm just saying that that's what this article seems to indicate, right? Okay. And it also says that it can be impacted by whether or not a person feels lonely. Yes. It also indicates that people with borderline personality disorder can feel stress more acutely than other people. And I think that would, that would be, I mean, that's pretty much accepted. Would you agree? Yeah, they don't handle stress well. <laughs> and, and I think you talked about it. I mean, someone with borderline personality disorder, they send a text, and if that's not responded to correctly, I mean, they get... Their world stressed. is ending. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The world is ending. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's now... And actually, Your Honor, at this point in time, I would move for admission of Defense Exhibit C under 803.18 Laurentries. Prosecution? I may have ordered our. You may. Defense Exhibit C that you have there in front of you 
did you use that in any way, shape, or form in formulating the opinions that you gave to the jury today? No, I was only provided this last week or the week before. Does it have any impact on your testimony or your opinions that you gave to the jury today? And our objection would be based on relevance. And May I see exhibit C first? Yes. Let me approach. Yes, please. Thank you. Also hearsay for that matter. That's why he's offering to admit it under uh, 80318. All right. Um, under 803.18, um, statements from a learned treatise uh, may be admitted. Um, it, they may be received as exhibits. I'm not going to allow this entire article to go back there, largely because it appears to have uh, a lot or it requires a lot of expertise to decipher um, large portions of it. Um, 803.18, however, says that if admitted, the statements may be read into evidence as the court permits. If there are certain specific statements, not the entire article, but if there are certain specific statements that you want to read into uh, the records, you can do that. And again, Your Honor, I'm asking it to be admitted as impeachment on Dr. Grimmett. She has diagnosed Ms. Stout with um, a personality disorder with borderline features. Um, she then indicated on direct that that was not a serious mental illness. I think this article impeaches her regarding that and how that borderline personality disorder can be a serious mental illness. The degree that it is, there are scientific terms and extra stuff in here that can be difficult for a lay witness to discern. I would say that goes to weight, not admissibility. And I'm asking it to be admitted under those grounds. I've made my ruling and I've given yes, you an option. So you can either read the specific statements that uh, you wish to have into uh, the record. It sounds like you probably covered most of them, not in exactly the same language that's in the article, but I've given you the option and I've made the ruling. Okay, and I would just read. Well, let me ask. You need this back? Yes. Okay. Well, I have a copy up here, but I'll just read it back. Oh, all right. Okay. Before we leave, borderline personality disorder, um, where does the term come from? Uh, it is um, considered to be on the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. And it, in the older DSM, I think under the DSM-2, it was actually listed under the schizo disorders. That is more information than I have. Okay. I don't have a copy of the DSM-2. Okay. All right, um, let's go on to your evaluation of this stout. One, well, Dr. Grimm, <laughs> you've actually done evaluations for me in the past, haven't you? I have. This evaluation that you did here seemed much more thorough thorough than a typical competency evaluation. Do you agree with that? Um, a typical competency evaluation that doesn't have a felony one charge on it. Sure. And generally on a typical competency evaluation, I mean, is this the, how many comps, what percentage of competency evaluations do you go through and listen to jail phone calls? Whenever they're made available to me. Okay. Is that usual or that unusual to review uh, jail phone calls? It's fairly unusual. Okay. And who provided you the jail phone calls? 
the district attorney's office. Okay. And they actually helped and assisted you in playing them, correct? Oh, yeah, they're always recorded in the format that's very difficult <laughs> to decipher. It is. When you initially started talking with Ms. Stout, she expressed some frustration with her attorneys. Yes. She was very frustrated because her attorneys would not come to visit her at the jail. Yes. And for context, this was during COVID. It was. And COVID changed a lot of the ways that we do stuff. Yes. Um, In-person visits became the rarity and a lot of stuff was done over WebEx or so forth. Yes. Um, this You did this one though in person, correct? Yes. Was there, where in the jail did you do it? Um, in the no contact booth. I don't remember if it was Alpha or I don't know, but it did was. Did it have it like the trap open or was the trap closed? I documented it was a no contact booth. I don't recall talking to her on the phone. Okay. So I'm imagining it must have had a trap. Okay. And just so that the jury's, you know, aware this is where you go. It's like you see on TV. The person comes in, there's a big, it's not glass, it's some type of clear plastic in between you and them. And then there's like a little trap door that opens yes. and shuts and the communication is done through there. Yes. Um, she was also in shackles. She was. And that kind of prevented you from doing some types of testing, correct? Uh, yes. Um, specifically, I mean, there were some further testing that could have been done, you know, regarding malingering and so forth, but that would is somewhat prohibited by the nature of the examination. Yes. Objectively, I understand that you I understand your position. She was malingering some symptoms to try to seem more mentally ill than she was. Objectively, though, she indicated to you that she did not want to be found crazy. First of all, I never said she was malingering. Okay. Okay. It I was, had concerns about feigning, but I did not use the, the vocabulary of malingering, so I just want to be clear. What, what's the difference between feigning and malingering? Feigning is intentional exaggeration or production of symptoms. Malingering takes it to the next level, assuming what the secondary gain may be. Okay. And... It, just to be clear, somebody can have a serious mental illness and feign symptoms. Yes. They're not exclusive. I outlined that in my yeah. conclusion, yes. Uh, I mean, and it's not necessarily even that uncommon. Uh, not in forensic settings. Not, not in forensic settings. So a lot of times you can have somebody who has a mental illness, but they will try to exaggerate those symptoms in hopes that you will come with a diagnosis that is helpful to them. Or they're so mentally ill that they don't understand how they present and they think they have to act worse. Otherwise, I might miss it. Okay. And to be fair, that makes the job of a forensic psychologist more difficult. Difficult and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> to figure out where the mental illness ends and where the feigning begins can be, can be tricky. Right. Um, she did indicate to you, though, very clearly that she did not want to be found crazy. Yes. Um, and then you actually even heard her on some jail phone calls with her daughter, Harley, indicating that she passed the first test, the first company exam with fine colors, and she was going to pass yours with fine, fine colors. Yes. So it, she would have known that she was found competent, and so she viewed that as passing, and she was going to pass your exam as well. Well, I, I recall that she had said, I don't recall whether it was to Harley or someone else, that she wasn't intending on passing as well, or doing as well in the second time yeah. that she did on the first. But there was at least one phone call to Harley that she passed the first one with flying colors, and she was going to pass yours with flying colors. Yes. You... Kind of got a history from her. Yes. Um, she indicated she grew up in North Carolina. One of the Carolinas. Yes, yes. I think so. And do you have your report up there? I do. And if it's okay with Mr. Young, I don't have a problem if anytime you need to refer to your report to refresh your recollection to do so. If you could just let us know that you're referring to it. Okay. Um, I'm fine with that. I have no problem with it. Okay. So she grew up in North Carolina. Yes. Um, 
she was raised by both her mother and father until they divorced when she was two. Yes. Um, she indicated that she didn't really have any contact with her father after that until she was much older. 17, I believe. Um, she indicated being raised a lot by her grandfather. Yes. Who was very religious. Yes. And would alternate between kind of a good guy, bad guy thing. Kind of a sometimes nurturing, sometimes harsh authoritarian. Uh, I didn't go into what she meant by that. Okay. Um, she did indicate that she was molested by her stepfather. Yes. How much detail did you get into that? None. None. Um, and that she was also angry at her mother because her mother didn't protect her from the molestation. Yes. That the mother had chosen the stepfather over her. Uh, she just, what I wrote in my report is what she told me uh, okay. that she hadn't forgiven her. When people or perpetrators molest children or stepkids in that environment, one of the keys to it is secrecy. That that can be an element, yes. That, that's that's generally isn't the element that the whoever is molesting a stepchild will do things in order to try to keep it secret within the family. I, I don't work with perpetrators. Okay. So I I just don't have a knowledge base for that. Then I will move on to my next chapter. She indicated you talked about kind of her work and vocational history. Yes. Um, she indicated to you um, that she primarily worked as a teacher, but she experienced some mental problems and she started having visions of her stepfather that interfered with her work. Yes. She also indicated numerous miscarriages yes. in her history. Did that sound out? That stand out, or I mean, it was notable, but remembering that my purpose is to establish if she's competent or not, sure. it wasn't important to answer that question. Okay. She indicated that she had been hospitalized in Canada. She said that yes. Um, that she was prescribed Zyprexa at uh, one point. Well, she was, I don't know if she was prescribed or offered, but she said she refused it. Um, at one point, she agreed to an, a, a Gideon? Geodon. Geodon. Um, and that's an antipsychotic. Yes. It's kind of an unusual antipsychotic, isn't it? No. No? Is that the brand name or is that the... It's the brand name. Okay. Uh, it might be palperidol. Don't quote me on it, um, but it, it, it's common. Okay. And then she was also described described in, in taking lorazepam. She was not taking at the time of the evaluation, but she had. Okay, and that would be for anxiety. She said it was for bipolar disorder, but it is a benzodiazepine. I mean, typically for anxiety. Lorazepam generally wouldn't be prescribed for bipolar disorder, would it? Um, it can have indications for bipolar disorder. I have never personally seen it prescribed for that, but when I searched it, it did say it could be used for bipolar disorder, but it's not a first line of treatment first line for bipolar. Thing. I mean, generally with bipolar disorder, you prescribe a mood stabilizer. I mean, prescribing is outside my scope of practice, sure. but yes, I would expect that to would see be. that they were being pres prescribed a mood stabilizer. Sorry. <laughs> and, well, th that was actually one of the reasons why you discarded the possible diagnosis of bipolar because she was given that coming from CMHIP to the jail but was not given a mood stabilizer and so that lessened the degree that that was actually a diagnosis because if it was actually bipolar disorder CMHIP would have more than likely then also given her a mood stabilizer prescription to take to CJC. I would have expected to see that, and that was definitely one of the factors I considered. Okay. But there was, and not only rule out, but the CMHIP in the transfer from her to CJC and the jail records indicated that CMHIP had diagnosed her with bipolar. So the CMHIP records indicated she had been diagnosed with bipolar, and then she underwent a review at CJC where that prescriber 
ruled out bipolar disorder. Okay. So just so that I'm clear, CMHIP had said she was bipolar disorder and then CJC and Dr. Moore said, no, she's not bipolar disorder. It was Holly Wallerstein. Oh, okay. Um, it wasn't Dr. Moore who did the review. Okay. But somebody reviewed it and said, no, I disagree with CMHIP. She's not bipolar. Yes. And, and it's always been confusing to me when you say rule out something. Because in the general terms, when you say rule out, that makes, every time I read it, I'm thinking you're saying, no, it can't be that. That's not what rule out means, correct? With a rule out diagnosis, it explicitly means there's not enough information to say they do or they did not have it. It needs to be ruled out. Yeah. This, so someone needs to do some more research and everything like that to either say yes or no. Right. Very confusing. Well, and you see it a lot in forensic evaluations because we have time limited yeah. meetings with people so we offer rule outs because we can't be sure and because it doesn't necessarily go towards competency correct i mean whether you know kind of with your whether or not she actually suffers from ptsd or not or suffers from anxiety or or not you didn't see either one of those affecting her ability to know what's going on or ability to work with her attorneys and so you have limited resource limited time don't have time to make that determination whether we have PTSD or, or anxiety. Right. It's not a psychodiagnostic evaluation. So I yeah. just cover what is necessary to support the opinion. A lot of some things that you considered in your evaluation were jail notes by deputies at CJC? I mean, I considered the notes. I okay. don't know that I gave them any more weight than anything else. Sure. Was there a concern on your part regarding bias of the deputies making those notes? Uh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, because, well, and, and so what everybody understands, the deputies at CJC are part of the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, correct? Yes. And that's actually the agency that has investigated and is assisting in prosecuting Ms. Stout. Yes. And so, you know, there's always concern for both actual bias and implicit bias. When you're, when, would you agree with that? There's bias is always a concern. Yes. What what is implicit bias? Bias that you're not aware of. Okay. And so deputies even trying to be fair may suffer from implicit bias in noting Ms. Stout's behavior. Yes. And that's something that you considered? Yes. Um, when you gave her two exams, correct? You gave her the structured interview and the What's the other one you did? Infest. Infest. Are you, I know, I don't, well, let me ask you this. Are you aware of literature indicating that oftentimes people with DID will have elevated scores on the MMPI2? Yes. And what is the MMPI2? The Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Second Edition. Okay. And I think what you're talking about, and so there is literature that people will have an elevated score on that test. If people who actually suffer from DID will look to be elevated, possibly given that false feigning. There, there are questions on the MMPI too that most people would not endorse that can reflect the experience of somebody with DID. And so it can look like they're exaggerating when it's real. Do you know, does the MFAST and the structured interview that you did, does that have those same type, are there any studies indicating that people with DID can have elevated scores on either one of those? Not that I'm aware of. The, the questions are not of the same nature that are on the MMPI-2. What's the difference between the MFAS and the MMPI-2? Oh, they're totally different tests for different purposes. The MFAS is purely a feigning measure. Okay. And it, the structured interview that you performed, um, that's the SR. The SERS 2? Yes. 
<laughs> that has different scales. Yes, so it's kind of an expanded version of the MFAST. Yes. Uh, how many different scales does it have? I want to say six. Okay, and of those six, only one indicated feigning? Yes. Um, the other ones were, um, I think it said, ev the other ones were ambiguous towards feigning. I think you said, I think you said ev ev um, No, I think she only elevated one scale. Okay. And then the overall index, which considers all the scales, was general indeterminate. Okay. She indicated there are notes. Um, they're called kites. What, what's a kite? A kite is a complaint, a grievance, or a request that an inmate can file to get certain needs met in the jail. Some of her kites were complaining that the solitary confinement was causing her mental health problems. Um, I think I read a kite where she was asserting mental abandonment. And that the solitary confinement was eats away at your soul and your brain feels like something's eating it. I don't think solitary confinement was the term. Maybe segregated housing. If you look on page seven of your report. Oh, stand corrected. Okay. I'm concerned why mental health has not helped me with the solitary confinement is the first line of the kite. Yes. And then the second line of the kite is I thought mental health as, is an advocate for mental safety. This eats away at your soul and my brain feels like something is eating it. That is what the kite says, yes. Are you aware or have you found, because I couldn't find any, any studies relating how solitary confinement could impact either disassociative identity disorder or borderline personality disorder? Uh, not specific to those disorders. I know that there's plenty of studies on the effects of solitary confinement on the mental health of an inmate, yeah. um, but I'm not familiar with specific diagnoses. Right. And I've bizarrely seen some studies that go both ways. Sometimes I've seen studies that indicate solitary confinement can be helpful for people with psychotic features. Um, I I have recently read, there, there was a, a large literature on the detriment of solitary confinement for quite a while. Yep. And there does seem to be some burgeoning literature that maybe it's not that bad. And it kind of depends on the different Individual. person. Some, some people have a mental illness, solitary confinement makes them much worse. Some people it appears surprisingly with a mental illness, solitary confinement can help them. Yeah, there's lots of individual differences. Could somebody who has disassociative identity disorder in different personas, could one of their personas as a defense mechanism try to feign mental illness? Hypothetically, I imagine so. Okay. And, and and again with with the feigning let me actually let me go back um your understanding with disassociative identity disorder when the well let me let me say this my understanding from the literature when you have a dissociative identity disorder personas are generally locked in the time that they are created are you aware of that um, no, I think that goes beyond my knowledge of the disorder. Okay. Some, would you agree? Well, let's just get this up. Let's agree. We, we were all, the, the vampire stuff is feigning made up garbage. We can agree <laughs> with that, can't we? Your words, not mine. All right. It almost seems made up garbage in a childlike way that this is so ridiculous that no intelligent adult would expect anybody to believe it. I would certainly say it was contrived. It was contrived and stupid. Uh, um, I, I didn't make any opinion as to okay. what kind of intellect it reflected. 
and whether or not it could have come from a persona who is locked in a childlike state. I just dismissed it as irrelevant to competency. Okay. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It was not believable and was not impacting. Justice the Vampire wasn't keeping her from discussing stuff with Miss Strobel. Correct. She did indicate that one of the things that would kind of soothe her when she suffered from anxiety was to hide under the covers. That it was more effective than medication, yes. Okay. I think we covered this a, a little bit, but in regards to determining, you know, the feigning and, and the degree, more tests would have been needed in order to be able to do that, correct? Well, my intention had been to give the MFAST the SERS if necessary, and had they not indicated any feigning, I would have liked to have given the PAI or the MMPI myself. Okay. Given the results of those tests, it didn't seem productive because if she feigned on those, it was likely she would also invalidate the ones she'd already invalidated in the previous evaluation. And we had a previous one where she, and the, the MMPI2 is a lengthy test. And the PA, both of them are, they're over 300 questions each. Okay. And because we had had one prior that was invalid, that would have been waste of the kind of short amount of resources that you have. Uh, well, just feigning is a dynamic concept. Just because you feign at one point in time doesn't mean you're always feign. Sure. So the fact that she'd invalidated it previously didn't mean I necessarily thought she would invalidate it again. But after she did not do well in the measures I gave her, that was an indication that she wouldn't be forthcoming on the test. With When you were discussing things with her and, and you're discussing with her, Oftentimes, her, her thoughts were kind of circular and almost tangential to a degree. I don't know that her thoughts were circular. Her speech is speech. circular. Yeah, speech. Um, I think I portrayed her in my report that she wasn't tangential. She always stayed on topic. Um, she just provided a lot more information. Um, I, I don't recall having to redirect her. I might have cut her off because she was trying to give me too much information, but I don't recall her being tangential. And I guess what I'm getting to is I kind of read your report, and if I read it incorrectly, let me know, that you gave some consideration as to whether or not her manner of speech would reflect disorganized thought. And there was some in the, they had some similarities in the interview that you had with her, but then you went and listened to the jail phone calls, and it didn't seem to be that way. Would that be accurate? Uh, well, it was it was those things and the kites where she wasn't making sense. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at all of that, and um, it seemed like with the phone calls, she was able to be very concise, given that there was a time constraint for the phone calls, and had that reflected an actual mental disturbance where there was thought disorganization, she couldn't have just selected to be concise. Okay. But at least w with you, there was some similarities between how she talked and how somebody may talk if they have a disorganized thought process? No. No? She wasn't disorganized. Okay. She was organized and garrulous, very, very wordy. Extra wordy as far as extra information that was not necessarily needed to the questions? Right. But not irrelevant. Ever. Okay, but uh, the extra information, I mean, that can be an indication of disorganized thought. If it doesn't make sense. Okay. And you indicated that a sincere belief that somebody can raise somebody from the dead would not be delusional? In the context that she provided it with her religious beliefs, that would be correct. I mean, she seemed to indicate that she believed, like Andrew Olmack, that she could raise Gannon from the dead. Right. And that wouldn't be consistent with facts, would it? Well, facts. Whether or not it's biology. <laughs> I thought you meant the facts of what Andrew Womack claims. To well, we can do. just. Um, I, I believe the, the standard accepted belief is that we cannot raise people from the dead. Yeah. It appears there's a faction of religious uh, practices that does, in fact, believe that things like that can happen. And given that she presented that idea in the context of a religious belief, 
I attribute it to, to her religious beliefs rather than a delusional belief. How can, I mean, oftentimes people with psychotic disorders have delusions that are religious in nature, correct? Yes. So how can it be distinguished between a delusion, which is basis of a psychotic disorder versus delusion that is based upon religious upbringing? That's a great question. <laughs> um, she believed what other people believed. It's a shared belief. Okay. So it's a shared belief specific to that religious uh, organization, or I don't know what the correct term would be. Um, so it didn't have the, the personal meaning to her outside of the context of that larger religious group. She was in step with what they report to believe in. Um, therefore, I consider it to be a religious belief. Whether or not it makes sense to me, whether or not it's rational is, is a different question. But in terms of looking at the diagnostic criteria, the fact that it's a religious belief shared by other people, and that's the context in which she shared it, it would not be considered pathological. Would it be pathological, though, considered as to a specific person, not just the belief that the dead can be raised, but that she has that innate ability herself to raise a specific person from the dead. If she had presented that idea to me without the context of the religion, I would certainly have had more concern. But she said, I know about this guy, and he said he did this, and I tried to find him because I want him to help me too. That's a totally different quality. And, and I mean, but clearly, in people who are raised in very religious upbringing, oftentimes will suffer from psychotic delusions that are based upon religion. That is not uncommon. But it won't be considered psychotic just because of the beliefs that they hold. If they're just holding their mainstream beliefs within their religion, that would not be considered. It's when they take it to a further level that goes outside of what the mainstream of that religion believes. Yeah, just a moment. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Green. Yeah. Redirect? Yes, thanks, Jeff. Did you consider that she could have just been making this up to make you believe that she was delusional? Uh, which part? The part about raising Gannon from the dead. Uh, I mean, I considered, I considered whether or not it was truly delusional. Um, did I consider whether she genuinely believed that? Um, that was probably part of my calculus. When we talk about uh, self-reporting and your interview with her and the reason why you want to look at all the collateral information, is that one of the reasons why is sometimes someone who's charged with first degree murder is going to not be truthful with you in the evaluation because they want to appear to be something they're not? Yes. I want to clear something up for the jury. Is the accent from Scotland? We've been taking bets. The accent's from Scotland. I just got to keep consistent with all my witnesses, figure out where they're from so the jury <laughs> knows that. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Mr. Tamini's uh, initial cross-examination when we're talking about um, trauma and that trauma is related to post-traumatic stress disorder. Do you recall that line of questioning that we started out with? Yes. Um, are there studies or in your opinion, are there any time frames as to when uh, someone might be experiencing delusions or psychosis as a result of trauma? Um, I don't know that there's a whole lot of research on trauma and psychosis. It is something that happens, it's not part of the diagnostic criteria. Um, so anecdotally, it's something that we see. Um, trauma itself, uh, the development of PTSD can happen fairly quickly after a trauma happens or there can be a delayed onset, um, sometimes up to a couple of years before st people start manifesting symptoms. Um, sometimes not until another traumatic event happens that it all comes crashing down. This sexual assault that Ms. Stock was telling you about that occurred between her and the stepfather, did she give you a time frame as to when that happened? No. Did you find any collateral resources that it actually happened? I didn't investigate it. 
And is that because it didn't it didn't play any relevance to your purpose for the evaluation? Correct. Um, hypothetically thinking is trauma that happens 20 years ago, is that gonna trigger something 20 years from the trauma? With nothing in between? Nothing in between. That wouldn't be typical. Why? Well, the, 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 there would have to be an explanation of what what's happening 20 years later that it's an issue now. What, what was the person able to do or why was it not impactful at the time? Um, I would just have a lot more questions. With the trauma that's impacting your psychosis or delusion, whatever we want to call it, would it have to be related to whatever the trauma was to begin with 20 years ago? No. Why is that? Um, the body experiences trauma and it doesn't have the, the brain to make sense of it. Um, so it's very physical. So the, the body just responds to the the danger, not necessarily the context or the meaning of the danger. So it doesn't matter what kind of trauma it is. Would you expect there to be stress or trauma in relation to killing an 11 year old boy by stabbing them 18 times, hitting them with a blunt force object four times, and then shooting them once and attempting to shoot them two more times? Would there be some trauma associated with that? There certainly could be. Would there be some stress associated with that? I would imagine so. Would you expect others to see that an individual who just did that, for instance, in a cross-country drive to Florida? I, I would expect if the person was traumatized by that happening, there would be signs of that. And if the individual was Ms. Stouck's daughter, who she'd known for 17 years, who'd been by her side the entire time, do you think her daughter might notice that there might be some stress or trauma related to that action of killing an 11 year old boy? I would think so. Disassociative identity disorder, um, is that a particular disorder that leads someone to murder someone? Um, I, I don't believe that there's a high base rate for that. Is there anything in the DSM-5 or mental illness that has a criteria that says someone with this mental illness is going to go out and kill an 11 year old boy? No. You understand why I'm asking that? Yeah. Does mental illness lead to murder? Not in and of itself, typically. Are there people who have serious mental disorders or mental illness that are able to function in life and society and obey the laws? Those are two different questions. Can they function to varying degrees? Um, does a mental illness cause you to break the law? No, it does not. People who suffer from disassociative identity disorder do they have recall or do they remember the events that might lead them to a forensic setting? I think that's probably a debatable issue. Um, there would probably be an argument that an alter may have been responsible and the memories don't cross over. So that's hard for me to answer. And is that because there's not a lot of data on that information? There's, there's not a lot of data and I would imagine it, it varies because somebody with those dissociative identity disorder could commit a crime as the primary persona, the host, and it has nothing to do with the alters, so then they would have memory of it. Um, so there's just there's too much information there. And so just to clear things up, when you're doing a competency evaluation, you're evaluating Ms. Stout on the day you're seeing her. Yes. In an insanity evaluation, you have to evaluate her on the day of the crime. Right. And would you look at her actions and the evidence associated with her actions in making that determination? For the sanity evaluation? Yes. Yes. Would it, would it necessarily mean much in an insanity evaluation how her mental illness may have progressed due to solitary confinement in a jail cell? It wouldn't speak to her mental status at the time of the offense. Go back to your uh, forensic interview. Uh, counsel asked you some questions about that. Do you recall that line of questioning? Not specifically. Um, I believe they asked you about how the prosecution provides you with the reports and things like that. Yes. Do you know who provides all the police reports to everyone in this case? 
the, the prosecutor's office is responsible to give to give it to everybody. Uh, like the state, the state evaluators, they get it from the prosecution. So I request it from the prosecution. Why didn't you ask that we go sit in on the interview with Ms. Stout and you during your evaluation? Um, I can't imagine why I would think that was appropriate or necessary. Um, a forensic evaluation is typically just conducted between the examinee and the evaluator. There can be impacts from having somebody else present in the room. Uh, there's statutory protections in the course of a competency evaluation that the information the defendant provides can't be used to incriminate them, so they don't need their own attorney there. Um, if their own attorney isn't there, I don't think it's appropriate that the prosecutor should be there. Um, I've just never encountered that that would be a reasonable request. Have you ever had um, a defense attorney sit in on an insanity evaluation with you? No. Why? Probably for the same reasons you just answered, I take it? Yeah, and it's never been requested. Um, for evaluations of this level of charge, it would be video recorded, so there would be no need for somebody to observe it because it's being memorialized. Her social history that you discussed with Mr. Tallini on cross-examination that's in your report was that based entirely on her self-reporting, what she's telling you? The portion titled social history, yes. The thing about miscarriages is based on what she's telling you? Yes. Uh, the notes that Mr. Tallini asked you about from deputies, were there other notes from mental health professionals within the jail that you relied on or at least considered in making your determinations? Um, I, I reviewed our entire jail record, so I was looking at jail deputies, mental health staff, um, so the prescriber, Dr. Moore's notes, um, and any deputies that had been tasked with making behavioral observations of her, all of them. I can just have a second, Your Honor. You may. Those are my questions, thanks. Do any of the jurors have any questions for Dr. Griffin? Looks like we have one couple coming. Council, uh, retrieve those. Mr. Young, if you would retrieve those sure. and council approach, please. Dr. Grimmett, can a difficulty or inability to face evidence or to be rigorously honest or to hold oneself accountable for consequences of actions be indicative of mental disability or past trauma related uh, BPD? Really long question. Can I ask you to break it into chunks? Sure. Um, can a difficulty or inability to face evidence or to be rigorously honest, or to hold oneself accountable for consequences of actions, be indicative of mental disability 
or past trauma-related borderline personality disorder? Okay, I think I think I can answer that as a whole. Um, would Would it help if you have the question in front of you? Okay, <laughs> I, I will need it back. Thank you. Okay, so the difficulty or inability to face evidence or be rigorously honest or hold oneself accountable for consequences are not signs of a mental illness. That would not reach the level of a mental disability. Can it be indicative of past trauma or BPD? Possibly. But the manifestations of that, the inability to face the evidence and be honest, um, those would not be considered um, symptoms of a mental illness that would reach the level of a mental disability. Okay. And then I need it back so I can read the next question. So everybody knows what it is. Can compulsive lying indicate mental disability? Compulsive lying is usually associated with an antisocial personality. Um, it would not be a symptom of a mental illness. So it would not reach the threshold of a mental disability. What does it take for a theory put forth in a psychology peer review publication to become mainstream enough to be published as part of some version of the DSM? <laughs> very good question. Um, my honest answer is the DSM is very political. Um, there are groups of people that want to put forth ideas and there's committees and there's voting and there's agendas and um, sometimes it can seem a bit capricious as to what gets accepted and what doesn't. Um, but with enough people endorsing ideas and testing out those theories and seeing that they're, they're accurate and gaining momentum, um, that helps it become more acceptable in the field and possibly into the DSM. Is it possible for a person with a great or normal upbringing to have anxiety disorder or to develop uh, disassociative identity disorder? Um, anybody can develop anxiety. Um, that's not particular to any kind of upbringing. Certainly people with difficult upbringings tend to have worse outcomes, but people with good, out, good, good upbringings can have anxiety for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm sorry, can you please, the DID please? Yes. Is it possible for a person with a great or normal upbringing to have anxiety disorder or to develop disassociative identity disorder? Um, dissociative identity dis disorder is very high, highly correlated with trauma. So you don't just start to dissociate by having a normal upbringing and nothing bad happened to you. Um, it's generally accepted that DID comes from some kind of bad event. Right. I will allow reasonable follow-up as to those questions only. Prosecution? No, thank you, Your Honor. Defense? Mr. Tolini? Could sincere belief that people are going to believe me, despite the fact that I have repeatedly lied to them about other stuff, be delusional? I'm, I'm not going to allow that. I'm not sure. Tell me where that fits in on the questions that I've allowed. The, the first question about whether pathological lying um, or refusal to face the evidence in front of you could be signed. Okay. Mental All right. Go ahead. I'm going to rephrase the question so I make sure I'm answering yeah. it correctly. Is it delusional to believe that despite the fact that I have lied repeatedly, now I think they're going to believe me? Yeah. That Can that be delusional in some sense? Um... I think that the practical approach to that would be it might be irrational, but it doesn't necessarily cross the threshold into a delusional belief. Um, is it fixed? Or is there any ability to consider an alternate point of view? There's, there's other questions I would need to ask before making a statement about that, but just because something's irrational doesn't mean it's delusional. Okay. And then as far as the question regarding when does an article become mainstream and in the DSM-5, the DSM-5 actually states that people with borderline personality disorder can suffer psychotic-like symptoms, including hallucination, body image distortions, ideas of reference, and I'm going to say this wrong, hypogenic phenomena during times of stress. 
I can't say it. Can you pronounce this for me? Let me approach. Um, hold on. Uh, let's finish the question, um, and then I'm not going to allow that question, but you can go ahead and finish it. Well, and Your Honor, it is asking when the publication become mainstream and in the DSM-5, and it appears that the ideas presented in that article are part of the DSM-5. Which is a, a different question than what is being asked, so I'm not going to allow that. Um, so you can, because the question is, what does it take for a theory put forth in a psychology peer review publication to become mainstream enough to be published as part of some version of the DSM? What you're reading sounds like it's from the DSM and is in the DSM. The question here is, what does it take for an article, a uh, psychology peer review publication to become mainstream enough to be published as part of the some version of the DSM? So I'm not gonna allow that question. Can I rephrase? You, you yeah, sure. Are you aware that the theory presented in that article had become mainstream enough to be put in the DSM-5? Um, I'm not familiar enough with the article to speak to whether or not it relates to what's in the DSM-5. In follow-up, are you aware the DSM-5 indicates people with borderline personality disorder can suffer from hallucinations? Suggestion, Your Honor, is to be on the scope. No, I'll allow that. Yes. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Doctor. You may step down. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take our noon recess. If I can have everyone back in uh, place uh, by 1.30, we should be able to start on time at that point. Again, don't discuss the case among yourselves. Don't discuss the case with anyone else. Uh, don't do your own independent research about any aspect of the case. Um, and we'll see you at 1.30. Have a good lunch. <laughs>